Good morning, everyone. It is 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall this morning here overlooking Times Square. This is Yahoo Finance Live. Here is your morning rundown. The market's mega week continues. Yesterday's rebound saw the Dow rally the most since June. And the S&P 500 ended the day out of correction territory, and we're just getting started here. The index's largest member, Apple, set to report earnings Thursday. Investors will closely watch the Federal Reserve's Wednesday rate decision, and Friday's jobs report will provide a much sought-after temperature check in a red-hot jobs market. Meantime, built for success. Caterpillar's profit rose in the third quarter due to major infrastructure investments. The rise in demand is thanks to the Biden administration's $1.2 trillion of bill funding investments in roads, railways, and bridges across the U.S. Now, cost controls and price hikes also help shield the company's profit from ongoing inflationary pressures. But shares pulling back this morning on a tepid outlook. And no tricks, just treats. Apple's scary fast launch event. That unveiled a line of brand new Macs and the company's latest in-house chip. Sales of the new line of MacBooks will be a crucial factor heading into the key holiday season. Following reports that orders of the new iPhone 15 have come up short in key markets. Investors closely watching the holiday season guidance in Apple's Thursday earnings. Today's morning driver, that would be Caterpillar. There's a lot of talk of a global slowdown, but what's the data telling us? Now, in the industrial equipment giant Caterpillar, they're seeing strong sales in the third quarter, though the outlook underwhelming investors in terms of the pre-market reaction. Now, Caterpillar beat the street with adjusted earnings of 552 a share. That's ahead of the 477 expected. Caterpillar's machinery, now you know it's used on construction sites, mining facilities, and industrial plants. You know those big yellow machines all over the world. It is seen as a true economic bellwether. Now, taking a look at construction specifically, total sales were $7 billion in the third quarter. In North America, sales increased due to higher sales volume. It was a different story in Latin America, though. It had some challenges there. And it's interesting to see that it's that question of not so much just what have you done for me lately, with regard to Caterpillar. It's what can you do for me next sure. uh, in terms of the results we're seeing. I mean, they're still in the middle of their earnings call right now, so we'll wait to see if something happens because there was initial pop and then a reversal in terms of the reaction in share price in the pre-market. Stiefel's got a note out already. I mean, by their um, measures, of course, it was a beat, as we talked about, um, and it said it's seen some strong uh, margin improvement that drove that. The backlog of orders that it had been dealing with is down year over year, so we saw that. Still has a buy rating on the stock. Um, it sees its 12-month price target heading to 300 right now. As of yesterday's close, it was around 242 a share. Uh, we'll see what happens in the market. So it, some of it could be guidance, and some of it could in, uh, indeed be some profit-taking that we're seeing uh, in terms of Caterpillar bread. Yeah, and of course, with the profits that Caterpillar is talking about here, that comes with this top-line growth here. Double-digit top-line growth is what they were talking about, and saying that it was due to some favorable price realization and higher sales volume. Now, if you look region by region, which we'll kind of break down in a short bit here, that is one area where the volumes, and specifically the volume sold, but also where the dealer inventories and how that is fluctuating region by region are key to pay attention to here. Staying with Caterpillar, there's, of course, this larger story about the earnings results, but then there's also the impact from property crisis hit in China. So what's the demand picture looking like there? Well, the economy is certainly looking fragile. Factory activity in the world's second biggest economy fell back into contraction in October. The official manufacturing purchasing managers index that slipped to 49 and a half this month to 50.2 in September uh, from 50.2 in September here. Now, why that's important. If you think about where the IMF ha has placed yep. their world economic outlook at this point and the revisions that we got in October of 2023, they're looking at the China real estate crisis mm -hmm. as a potential global economic risk. And, and here's why, of course, as we think about what this means for production, if real estate prices in that region are artificially propped up, they say balance sheets will be protected for a while, but this may crowd out other investment opportunities, reducing new constructing, hint, hint, impacting Caterpillar, mm -hmm. and have an adverse impact on local government revenues 
reduce land sales as well there. Right. I'm seeing a lot of just reinforcing commentary about what you're speaking of there. Just the housing slump that it has been grappling with and yep. the just larger ripple effect as a result, the slowdown in infrastructure spending. China's really been struggling to recover ever since it came out of the pandemic, and it really just hasn't hit the stride that was expected for the sec world's second largest economy. Uh, so that's just a, really a challenge. And when you think about new exports and imports, Import orders uh, just shrinking for an eighth month in a row. It just shows that ongoing challenge that China's having. Absolutely. Well, it seems the stock market could be more of a trick than a treat this October. Major averages remain on pace to end the month in the red as bond market volatility and conflict overseas contribute to the market downturn. Our next guest remaining cautious on what lies ahead for stocks heading into the final months of trading. For more, we're joined by Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers Chief Strategist. Steve, always a pleasure to get some of your insights and grab some time with you here early morning. So thanks for joining us. First and foremost, walk us through this. I mean, of course, we we, we put the Halloween spin on it, the, the, the more trick than treat here. But walk us through your thesis and how you're looking at the last two months of this year and what type of activity could permeate over into the beginning of 2024. Good morning, Brad. Um, you know, the way that I'm looking at it right now is we have um, – you know, we're, we're in the setup now where this is our, likely to be, our, barring something crazy this afternoon, our third straight month where we've seen lower highs and lower lows. Um, that is kind of the definition of a downtrend when you start to see it three months in a row. Now, does that mean we're, we're you know, going to plunge from here? Not necessarily, but the setup isn't great. Um, you know, at this point, I think now the onus is for the market is – to prove that we've bottomed and can have a lasting rally, yesterday's yesterday's jump notwithstanding, um, you know we do tend to get very sharp rallies when you're in a bit of a correction or a, you know or bear market. Actually, uh, we're not in a bear market, but bear you know bear market rally. It had that bear market rally tone to it. Um, you know, so right now that's kind of my concern is just the 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 trend is is not favorable, um, and we're starting to see erosion even in some of the magnificent seven. Which makes me concerned that if you know the Magnificent Seven shrinks, uh, you know, to a big, you know, to you know, to a big six, a big five, whatever you want to start to call it, um, that that's got some interesting dilemmas ahead for the stock market. Steve, you read my mind. I was literally thinking about the Magnificent Seven, and I want to ask you: Is that the safest space within equities as you head through the balance of the year? Um. Diane, I'm going to have to go with no on that one. I think that you know, some. I, I think at this point you can't look at them as seven stocks together. Um, you know, we'll learn a lot more when Apple comes out, but we saw some very mixed results from them. We saw Alphabet disappoint. Um, we saw, you know, we we saw Microsoft, you know, do very well. Amazon, you know, Amazon did well, but they've got an extraordinarily high valuation. Tesla is, I think, at risk of being kicked out of the club right now because they've been really underperforming since their earnings have come out. Um, and Nvidia, we won't hear from them for a couple more weeks, but you know, it, it could, you know, that that chart is kind of almost looking like a head and shoulders. Um, I hate to draw head and shoulders prematurely, but um, you know, the, there there are some real risks here, and these stocks are expensive. It's not like you're taking a risk on a stock that's got a very, you know, uh, very uh, affordable valuation. You know, based for the most part, you've got these stocks trading with 25, 27 forward PEs. You've got the other 493 trading with around a 16, 17 PE. Um, and that's a big valuation gap. And, and that's the risk for investors if they just sort of decide that these are the paragons of safety. Some might be, some might not. And we'll learn more as the, as, uh, from Apple and, and later NVIDIA. What, what is the true paragon of safety, especially in a downtrend like this, uh, as you've kind of looked at and, and charted this over the past kind of few months here, Steve? The true paragon of safety is is cash at, you know, nearly 5 percent, quite truthfully. Um, you know, when when I think investors need to be thinking of is value uh, is volatility adjusted returns um, right now when you can in, when you can invest basically your money anywhere in the curve and get in the high fours, if not five um, with lower volatility, particularly on on, you know, short term fixed income like T-bills, like bank accounts, like money market accounts um, there. There. Uh, you know, everything is based off the risk free rate and the risk free rate right now is over five percent. Not every, you know, so that's your T-bill rate. Um, and so the question you have to ask yourself is how much volatility am I willing to endure 
to do better than that 5%. And that 5%, which we'd always heard there is no alternative, is an alternative. Um, and so that's the competition for equity markets right now. So that's the truly safe space. Now, this doesn't mean just, you know, run to cash and, and stick it, you know, stick it all in T-bills. But what it means is you have to be very selective. And I think I would be looking much more at value stocks than growth stocks, because I think if there is a downtrend, they've already priced in a bit of a downtrend as opposed to some of the high flyers. Well, Steve, there's always a chatter about, you know, kind of playing too much in individual plays versus index and, you know, passively managed uh, index funds and ETFs outperforming, say, these individual plays. What's your thought or what's your thinking about just kind of taking a more of a passive approach to equity investing then? There's really nothing wrong with that. You know, the, the, the key is a lot of it has to do with our markets moving together or separately. Um, you know, and right now, the problem you have with a lot of the passive indice indexing is they're very top heavy. And so, you know, you look at the S&P 500 and it, it, the, those, se those seven stocks we've been discussing mm -hmm. are about 25 percent of the index. If you put your money in the NASDAQ 100, that's about 50 percent of the index. So, these, you know, even passive indexing has its risks to it. You know, for example, today I was looking at the difference between consum the consumer staples and the consumer discretionary uh, ETFs, and neither has done particularly well this year. But consumer discretionary has outperformed, and the reason for that is it's 40% Amazon and Tesla, 20% of one, 20% of the other, and 60% of everything else. And so this is, you know, so even even within your passive indexing, you have to be very careful of the fact that um, they're not as in some cases, they're not as diversified as you might think they are. And so you have to go into it recognizing that. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers, Chief Strategist. I think my takeaway is cash is king again. We'll see. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, All right, Diane. Apple Take care. Scary Fast. You got it. Apple Scary Fast event featured a host of new product announcements, including its newest MacBook Pro lineup. The tech giant's new products will feature its custom chips, the M3, M3 Pro, and M3 Max. Yahoo Finance tech editor Dan Howley has the details. Dan, was it scary for you? It was not scary, though they did stick to the Halloween theme the entire way through, but they did announce. Uh, some new chips and some new laptops, as well as a new iMac. So uh, let's just break it down real quick. The the first things that uh, they introduced were these new chips, the M3 line. And uh, Apple says that this is the first time that they're rolling out uh, three chips at once. It's the M3, the M3 Pro, and then the top of the line M3 Max. Uh, the difference between them really is that the M3 uh, is meant for you know general consumers. The M3 Pro is meant for more prosumers. Uh, people that are doing some video editing, some photo editing, some gaming, uh, and then the M3 Max is for what you know they've essentially said were people who are doing uh, high-end CAD uh, uh, illustrations, uh, people who are doing 3D animation, and then uh, folks uh, who are dealing with large language models and AI development. And so uh, the products uh, that they announced are the MacBook Pros, uh, the 14 and 16 inch models, uh, and those are gonna start uh, at 1599 for the uh, 14 inch model uh, with the regular M3. Uh, an M3 Pro version starts at 1999 and then the uh, 16 inch MacBook Pro starts at 2499. So little pricey proposition there, but that's always been the case with the, the MacBook Pros. Uh, and really, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting to, to look at here is how Apple is, is positioning these. They generally, try to lean more towards creators, uh, video editors, photo editors, folks along those lines. But this time around, the way they were positioning these products was for uh, the average person, uh, you know, a student, uh, a uh, office worker, small business owner, uh, gamer. They, they really are seemingly trying to hit a large swath of the population rather than uh, what they're traditionally known for, which is, you know, slightly more niche users as well as, you know, big Apple fans. And so uh, they're they're really trying to expand uh, out there. They talked about how there's uh, medical professionals who are using these uh, for different tests or different diagnostics, uh, diagnoses. Uh, there's also uh, the gamer aspect to it where they uh, explain that uh, the uh, laptops are better at running games overall. They have new effects, uh, dynamic caching for the GPU, which is supposed to uh, be better for gaming as well as uh, 
3D animation, uh, ray tracing uh, that's hard, well, hardware accelerated, uh, and really saying, you know, over time, they're hoping to grow that gaming category and become uh, a larger name there. So, you know, these are, are very impressive chips. Uh, they're three nanometer. They're, uh, according to Apple, at least the first three nanometer chips that are available for consumer uh, computers. Uh, they're going to continue to do what they've done for Apple, which is provide huge amounts of performance and massive amounts of battery life. Uh, you know, they're, they're saying up to 22 hours for the 16 inch. So we'll just have to see when we can get our hands on one. But, you know, it, it's it's a, another big kind of move for Apple in this, this Mac space. As of right now, Dan, and in this most recent quarter, we should say, the, the Mac line really only accounted for, what, about 8% of the total financial performance for this company. You combine that with the fact that Gartner, as you've written about, has essentially called bottom on the PC market demand. So what does it mean that Apple is making these types of investments, these types of announcements even, in terms of the broader PC landscape? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just great timing for them to to come out with these just as, you know, as you said, Gartner called the bottom uh, of the, the PC market. You know, after two years of declines, they're saying that it should start to return to growth. And so that that's just really fortuitous timing for Apple. Um, you know, these products are planned, you know, obviously very far in advance. Uh, and so I think it just happened this way that they, they landed now. Um, I think that it'll help Apple grow the Mac uh, section, but I wouldn't expect to, uh, you know, going into these announcements coming up for the the, the earnings uh, to take anything away from what these products are going to do for the prior quarter. The prior quarter closed already, so you're going to be looking forward to uh, to the next quarter for for an impact here. Uh, for the current quarter that's that's about to uh, be reported, though, yeah, uh, Apple sales uh, for for laptops are supposed to be lower, for desktops are supposed to be lower. Um, I forgot to mention they also uh, announced the the 24 uh, inch iMac. That's their uh, all-in-one desktop. Uh, very popular among consumers, especially uh, you know people who have multiple people in their homes. Uh, so that's also uh, a chance for them to buoy their bottom line after uh, not upgrading that for for a few years there. So you know overall, it, it looks as though this is going to help improve the the Mac revenue. Uh, we just have to see how much of an impact it has, um, and you know what it means that we're going to see a turnaround in that segment uh, of uh, the you know broader uh, consumer tech landscape, especially since we saw such steep declines over the past two years. Yeah, quite the mischief night announcement coming from Apple there. Oh, mischief sure. night, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, we can uh, pontificate over Slack. What's, what's the real origins and the meaning behind them doing this launch at night, uh, yeah. which would have been in the morning in Asia Pacific time what it really is here. Dan, thanks so much for breaking some of this down for us this morning. Certainly do appreciate it. Everyone, we've got just outside of 10 minutes until the opening bell. Let's see what stocks are doing here pre-market. For that, we've got our own Jared Blickery standing by. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad. Uh, let's take a look at the Wi-Fi Interactive here on the chart for S&P 500 futures overnight. You can see after, uh, you can actually see. Jared, we're just going to cut you off for a hot second. I think we're going to get your we're mic We're having some mic here. issues right now hearing you. We are seeing the futures here as of this morning, though. Right now, the S&P 500 futures, they were holding on to some gains here, the NASDAQ futures. You're seeing those lower as of right now. NASDAQ futures down by about one-tenth of a percent. Dow futures also lower at this point in time. Flat just barely to the downside by about one-tenth of a percent. We'll round that off to a few things at play. Of course, we've got yep. a huge earnings earnings week here, but we've also got some consumer confidence data that the markets are going to be paying close attention to at the top of the 10 a.m. Yes. hour. And then additionally here, uh, we've got even more, and we mentioned the earnings, Apple, as we were just discussing, yeah. that's going to be in focus. And you often see a bit of a holding pattern ahead of what the Fed is sure. doing. So that could certainly be some of what is in play today. Um, and yeah, so we, it's certainly what we're watching, see how we'll close out October. Um, and I think we've got that technical issue fixed with Jared. Professor Jared, are you back in business? I would love to be. I, I'll say classes in session. That's classes what in session, over all right. from Brian Chung back in the day. But this is the S&P 500 futures overnight. We've been in the red, we've been in the green, and we we're just coming down almost to the break even line. NASDAQ futures underwater just slightly, so are the Dow. Uh, but I want to focus on the treasury market here, and we can take 
take a look at what the 10-year uh, uh, T-note futures are doing, and you can see they're almost back to break even. Yesterday was an interesting uh, afternoon in the bond market. Uh, we were talking about the Treasury refunding, and we're going to get that full statement uh, tomorrow, but we do have a little sneak preview of what's going on. And uh, borrowing needs, as estimated, actually came down for the month, and so that's taking a little bit of pressure off of the uh, bond market here. And here we have Treasury bar borrowing estimates. Um, this is the third quarter right here, and here is the fourth quarter. Now, a market difference. What happened yesterday when we got that small decrease, that was the same event where we got an increase over the uh, in the prior quarter, and that was actually quite a disruptor to the markets. Uh, the, the street was not expecting that much borrowing to take place, so a little bit of pressure taking off the markets. We're going to get those full auction calendars tomorrow, along with some recommendations from the Treasury market, and you can bet that we'll, we will be on top of that. Uh, just want to emphasize that next week is a huge, huge week for Treasury supply in three-year notes, 10-year and 30-year, all told $114 billion. That's an estimate that could change, but uh, suffice to say it's going to be over $100 billion. Uh, let's take a look at some heat maps here and see what's going on in, in the early going, and uh, we'll see where we land right here. Here's the NASDAQ. I'm going to put some overnight quotes on, but all this green in the background, that's what happened yesterday. Pretty solid day. Uh, you can see Apple was up 1.23 percent, but is down nine-tenths of a percent this morning. Similar story for N NVIDIA there, but Microsoft adding about 50 basis points to its gains of two percent yesterday. Now let's take a look at the sector action. We do have communication services. That is in the lead, up 43 basis points in the morning, uh, up 2.06 percent yesterday. That's followed by real estate, staples, financials, materials, and energy, all of those outperforming on the top row there. To the downside, we're seeing a little bit of negative action in the industrials and in tech. And uh, let's take a quick look at some of my leaders. It looks like the cannabis ETF, MJ, that is the strongest. That's up almost 5 percent. Then we have defense, then we have regional banks, IPOs, home builders. To the downside, what's in the red? We got gambling, Korean stocks, and Chinese stocks, and we'll take a quick look at those. China, under a bit of pressure, just looking at the pre market quotes, Pinduoduo, for instance, down 3.71% and down another 1.82% in the pre market, guys. All right, Jared, stay with us for the opening bell. We've got just inside of eight minutes until that marker here. And we've got all your markets action live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. 2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley year. Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation. Mortgage rates. The diabetes drug. Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest. The marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. <laughs> Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it, November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance.
Let's take a look at some individual movers in the chip space. First off, AI market leader NVIDIA. The introduction of new U.S. export controls may have a severe impact on the chip maker. According to the Wall Street Journal, NVIDIA may be at risk of losing out on orders worth $5 billion from China. The report notes that Chinese tech giants, including Alibaba and Baidu, had placed orders worth billions for 2024, and NVIDIA had planned to deliver some of them in the second half of November, which was the initial deadline to restrict shipments of advanced artificial intelligence chips to the world's second largest economy here. Now, we know much of this has continued to stem from the both U.S. and China and the kind of tit-for-tat play out that we've seen with regard to intellectual property and how that's now impacted the semiconductor segment here, most notably, as the Journal had reported on this, spokesperson right. for NVIDIA saying the company has been working to allocate its advanced AI computing systems, which use those graphic chips affected by the rules to customers in the U.S. and elsewhere pursuing additional supply here. And one of the things that stood out to me in that uh, report was also just that the, uh, the pullout of the Biden administration and the tenuous relationship that the U.S. has with China, just part of those efforts to kind of crack down on the proliferation of our AI, mm -hmm. chip supply and AI in general, and what that could do in terms of China's powers with regard to AI tools, um, what China could do in terms of its utilization with AI within military um, uh, capabilities uh, and cyber warfare in general. So that, of course, is the worry there. I mean, could it be another spy balloon kind of issue? Uh, you know, so you can certainly see how that's playing out in terms of like, it, 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 and we know that NVIDIA is the leader in this space. So that is why that's one of the reasons there's a microscope on this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for NVIDIA and I mean, I was, I was contemplating being Jensen Huang for Halloween, given the success that he had seen and the stock has seen for NVIDIA over the course of this year. It's been one of the biggest stock stories of 2023. But even thinking back to what Steve Sosnick was telling us from Interactive Brokers a, a moment ago here about where for the AI names that have really made up mm -hmm. that Magnificent Seven, whether they be investors in generative AI, whether they be their own kind of research, development, homegrown tools, applications, products for chips, in this case for NVIDIA, or whether they be acquirers uh, in, in an acquisition sense uh, for artificial intelligence. That has been the larger theme that has really boosted not just these companies, but a lot of other companies that have been riding the coattail of it. So this is the first instance here, especially as it's played out in now what is a years long tit for tat trade war that has stemmed all the way from social media companies into energy purchases mm -hmm. and commodities. Um, and now into some of the chips where a lot of the chip development and capacity, and this is particularly about fabrication as well, in addition to that intellectual property, that fabrication process and reducing reliance on companies like TSMC for the world's kind of uh, fabrication and, and the wafer processing as well, that's where you've seen the U.S. invest more at the same time as cracking down yep. on where that intellectual property uh, could be shipped to other parts of the world and then harvested and tried to be replicated as well. Yeah, and I mean, and this is, has been a year upon year upon year uh, in, in instance that we've seen with regard to this trade tit for tat. Uh, that's the opening bell you're hearing on Wall Street. We've got stocks uh, kicking off a trading today at the end of October. Let's get right over to Professor Jared. What are you watching in terms of the market action? I am watching a mixed market to close the month, but just barely because the Dow is down slightly. The Nasdaq, I'm not sure if uh, that is from yesterday yet. We, I think we're waiting for an updated print there. So let's skip to the sector action, and we can see bullish looking here. Real estate and utilities are in the lead, so that could be arguably a day a defensive setup when those are leading the market because they are very interest rate sensitive as well. Industrials here, materials, both of those in the red uh, for today. Let's take a quick look at the month. And I think this kind of tells a story here. Utilities up uh, almost 6%, everything else in the red. It is interesting that among the worst uh, performers or least bad performers here, we have staples and tech. Tech kind of a bastion of safety. I think that's due to Microsoft. 
Apple is only down about half a percent this month, and so that at least it's not taking away uh, from that industry. Now, we have consumer discretionary, that's XLY, that retail sector is down 6%, energy close on its heels, down 4 now, I'm going to skip back to uh, the intraday action so we can see, and now we see a couple more sectors that have drifted into the red, including industrials and tech. And here's how the NASDAQ is looking. Um, looks like I don't see too many outperformers here or underperformers. We got Amgen down about 3.5%. I was just taking a look at Tesla. Here's a year-to-date chart, and I just want to point out that just above 200, we had previous resistance, which now uh, has broken as support. We did have that contact here, uh, but it has traded to the downside. Last week, we were tracking some of the breakdowns in the indices, the NASDAQ coming under correction. All of those were pretty bad. I did, uh, I did note that in seasonality-wise, we do have the potential for a nice bounce, and Michelle Schneider was here the other day. She was talking about the potential too, but a lot of people I talk to only believe it's going to last a couple weeks, and then they would be looking to sell into that. Uh, not to get too far away from or too far ahead of ourselves, we've got a huge, huge day tomorrow with that Treasury refunding announcement in the morning. Uh, we'll bring that to you live. And then the Fed decision at 2 p.m. and Jerome Powell taking the stage at 2.30 p.m. Uh, here's what the banks are doing today. You can see they're just up uh, slightly. If you look at some of the uh, left side of the screen there, UBS and Capital, that's Capital One, that's down about 1% and half a percent respectively. Uh, let's take a look at some of the Chinese shares that were under pressure before the market. They have opened up in the red, except for Netties here. Alibaba down 1.5%, Pinduoduo down half a percent. And then taking a look at some of the uh, disruption trades, besides Tesla and Shopify, actually a pretty bullish setup here. Just to put things in perspective, here's what it looks like for the month, though. So just a reminder, October, not really that good for some of the uh, fringier parts of the market, as I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jared Blickery, thank you so much for the deep dive. Appreciate it. All right, staying with the chip maker theme, we are also watching on Semiconductor after releasing its third quarter results. The company beat Wall Street expectations. Revenue and adjusted EPS coming in slightly higher than what analysts anticipated. But importantly, the company gave a weaker fourth quarter earnings forecast on now predicts uh, Q4 revenue of between $1.95 billion to $2.05 billion, which would represent a year-over-year -year decline from its more than $2.1 billion previously. Now, it's only down about 3% in the early action today. It was down much worse in the aftermarket um, and it was down in the pre-market as well, but you're seeing kind of a little bit of a uh, cooling of how sharp that turn was. Um, T.D. Cohen's got a note out on on semi headline: "Nothing broken but a dented hood." So mm. it's basically saying uh, they put this out at 10 o'clock last night, so they were working hard. <laughs> uh, that it was an ugly stock reaction, um, but they felt like it was in the long term, a little overblown in terms of that reaction. So uh, you're seeing, I guess, some of that play out now that people have had time to digest it. Um, they noted that it's this reaction, a reversal from Onsemi's pristine execution uh, and actions to de-risk its model over the past couple of years. Um, there was this element of uncertainty with regard to SIC, the silicon carbide um, business. Sure. Uh, so, and that just putting some pressure, but saying that this looks like just a speed bump for OnSemi. Yeah, two big things that I took away from this report. Number one, the, the PSG part of this business, which if anybody's looking at the acronyms that they use for each of the segments of their business, this is the Power Solutions Group. They generate the most revenue, nothing at least uh, in terms of the, the headline figures that they reported there, that should cause too much alarm. The year-over-year -year move higher was about 10 percent. However, there was weakness, and this is the other part of it, in two of their other segments here, and that is the Advanced Solutions Group here. Um, as you think about where that revenue base comes in, it's typically one of the second largest largest producers of revenue for the business. That was down 15% year over year. And then you've got the intelligent sensing group. That was down year over year as well by about 4%. So all in, that's what drove the majority of these year over year declines in revenue across the business segments. So if there is anything investors or the analysts are paying close attention to here on the day, I imagine it's those. Those are the two areas of weakness out of the three business segments for this company. Another stock that we're watching here today is Wolf Speed, taking a look at shares of the manufacturer, the wide 
band gap semiconductors. Yeah, try saying that 15 <laughs> times fast. They're up by about 19%, mm -hmm. ripping to the upside, speeding to the upside. Uh, we'll figure out, we'll workshop we'll it. But ultimately here, all around, looking at September quarter EPS and December quarter guidance here, the upbeat forecast suggests that Wolf Speed is on track to meet its production targets at its Mohawk Valley plant in New York which the company has been hoping to bolster its results after many delays here. Over the past month, not a great story for the stock. It's down, and over the past three months, uh, even worse, down by about 49%. Well, it's definitely off to the races today, so we'll see how far it uh, runs through the balance of the day. Uh, analysts reacting pretty well to um, its results. Now, for people who aren't familiar, Wolf Speed makes those silicon carbide chips. Those are used to they extend the range of EV electric vehicles. Uh, T.D. Cohen put out another note. They were busy last night, 10 p.m.-ish. Um, they consider it a small step in the right direction in terms of wolf speed. So to your point about how the stock has performed this year, um, they see it as welcome signs of progress. Momentum will take multiple quarters. Um, they like their ability to kind of ramp up its uh, wafer capacity to service its MVF facility. Um, they say that's a critical hurdle to uh, the company. So, you know, you've got um, some cautious optimism there out of TD Cohen. Uh, Oppenheimer also out with a note on Wolf saying that it was a solid quarter. There is still some execution risk with regard to um, how Wolf performs. They also highlighted the MVP, the Mohawk Valley ramp, um, contributing about $4 million in revenue to the quarter. So that was a pullout that Oppenheimer and TD Cohen saw with regard to Wolf Speed. Um, so, but the stock is certainly performing very well today yeah, in this one the, space. One thing that investors could be paying attention to here as well is the market opportunity. The company talked about this in the report, saying that, that the market opportunity for silicon carbide stands at $6 billion today. That's up from $400 million just five years ago, so some kind of rough of the uh, rough kind of back of the notebook math here, that's about 15x here. Now, think about where that is right now to where they position or where they believe that that's going to get to. They believe that this is the only pure play silicon carbide company in the market today, Wolf Speed, uh, and they believe that they're best positioned to capitalize on a tailwind that represents a potential $20 billion addressable market by, 20, 20, uh, by 2030, excuse me. And so with that potential move higher in the TAM, in the total addressable market, mm -hmm. uh, positioning themselves to to kind of stave off any competition, uh, that would prove as uh, a potential tailwind for this company moving yeah. forward as well. Definitely looking like a buy the rumor, sell the news kind of situation today. We'll see. All right, shares of AMD also in focus. They are moving a little bit. Let me take a look at where that stock is right now. A little bit under pressure this morning, down about 1.8%. The chip maker looking for power up ahead of its third quarter results after the bell today. Uh, and um, AMD, the AI hype, and excuse me, the AI hype AMD is playing catch up with NVIDIA, which currently rules the roost in chips and AI chips. Investors will certainly be turning in, tuning in to AMD's earnings call to learn more about its new artificial intelligence accelerator chip and the growth prospects that could bring to the company. Now, recently, AMD CEO Dr. Lisa Su made the case that the field in AI is more wide open than it might appear right now. An idea AMD seems to be betting on. I mean, AMD certainly. Uh, it's trying to, you know, kind of shore up its position in potentially the number two spot. But we know that NVIDIA has been far and away the leader when it comes to this AI chip space. So AMD, in just in hyper focus, um, you had Susquehanna analysts uh, reaffirming its positive rating on AMD. Um, cautious about forecasts for next year. So we will we will certainly be looking forward to see not just what its results are, but how does it guide? Yeah, any talk that we continue to get about AI right now, especially given the fact that early on this year, that was the big catalyst for much of the gains that we had seen and really driven by what NVIDIA was saying about the demand profile that they were seeing in the market and how other companies were also adding on to that fervor and investors certainly kind of riding that hype cycle here. At this point, though, at the end of the year, it, it kind of feels like you're squeezing the last bit of paste out of that, that, that toothpaste. <laughs> uh, and so ultimately, it's really a larger question of what the outlooks are saying at this point, too, in tandem with the actual results and where that's coming in. And 
I kind of lean on Samsung and what they're saying mm -hmm. here today as well or in their most recent earnings that just dropped saying that they're seeing ongoing strength for high-end AI-oriented products here and that the demand for generative AI as they're pointing towards the fourth quarter outlook, that should remain strong. And of course, the demand for AI and normalizing inventory levels, that's going to be the broader outlook here. So what that normalization of the AI demand looks like, that's still uncertain. And the prices to which, the, the, the rate at which we can still expect some type of both margin growth and overall just uh, a total addressable market growth for these companies too. But this comes in pillars. You've got applications, you've got models, and you've got chips. And right now, it's been the chips that have been winning over the course of this year thus far until we get to that core kind of model and then the applications that yeah. sit on top of that as well. well. One of the concerns with AMD is um, where the demand will be, especially if some of these corporate budgets, if the CapEx spend sure. gets reduced when you think about this. Yeah. Absolutely. Space. There's much more to pay attention to on this front. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market side. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. They command multi-billion dollar empires and dominate the boardroom. I admit when I'm wrong. What you want to do is control your controllables. Decisions that impact your investments are made by them every single day. Profit and purpose go hand in hand. Now, Yahoo Finance grants you exclusive access to these titans of industry. Discover the motivations behind industry-altering decisions and the visionaries who imprint their legacy on the world's most renowned companies. Join us for our groundbreaking series, Lead This Way. Construction spending and higher prices powered a strong third quarter for Caterpillar, allowing the company to beat analyst expectations for earnings despite fears of a global economic slowdown. But a tepid fourth quarter forecast indicates that the momentum may not continue. The machinery giant says it expects revenue to be, quote, slightly higher on a yearly basis, disappointing analysts who expect a 5% bump over the next three months. Now, we can already see softness in construction spending, uh, beginning, in construction beginning to creep in for some international segments in the company's third quarter results. For a deeper dive into this report, let's bring in Michael Schlitzke, uh, DA Davison's Managing Director of Equity Research. Michael, thanks so much for joining us this morning. So let's jump right into Caterpillar's results. They released them this morning. You saw an instant negative reaction um, in terms of the share price. Uh, what was your initial reaction to its results? 
I, I think an initial cautious reaction makes a lot of sense. Uh, backlogs were down roughly eight and a half percent over the prior quarter. Um, and it sounded like some dealerships were looking to increase some of their inventories, um, especially on some larger equipment like, like excavators. Those are some real challenges to numbers, at least, uh, for, the, uh, for the fourth quarter. Despite some comments that most end markets do remain strong, and they, they do uh, look for a pretty strong 2024. Michael, there, there was one thing that really caught my attention here during the quarter and kind of wrote it down, especially on the regional basis here, where LATAM, that was down by about 31 percent. You looked at China as well, all in on the um, uh, on some of the business there was down by about 8 percent. When you think about ultimately how those delivery metrics and, and not just kind of delivery as we would think about with some other auto manufacturers, but specifically in how their dealers are working through inventory, it's a different dynamic here. So kind of make sense of this for us. Where, where are they prioritizing growth for this company? Well, in the construction business, which is, which is, which is what I think you're um, referring to, North America is still the main driver of that by a very wide margin. And um, in North America, in construction, retail sales are off about 20%. In mining, they're off about 49%. So luckily, yes, they are seeing some decline in China, which is still uh, 5 10% of, of, of sales overall. That M is, has been growing in, in previous years, but it is kind of rolling over or at least lapping. Uh, but luckily, um, the North American business is actually doing quite well right now. Michael, when you think about the direction of Caterpillar uh, through the balance of the year and into 2024, um, is there the expectation, like, would you be looking for more, say, efficiency or cost-cutting action um, that you expect to see for the company? Yeah, um, so Caterpillar is always looking to cut costs. They always have every quarter a restructuring charge, they call it, which is ways to um, make their business more efficient. It doesn't sound like we're in an environment for 2024 where, where, where we're going to see most of their businesses completely roll over and decline substantially. I doubt they're looking to make some some major cuts there, either to production facilities or to people. There's always efficiencies. We just it just does not seem like we're at that kind of a, of a um, decline right now. Michael, you currently remain neutral on the stock. You've got a price target of $294. What would you need to hear? from this company's leadership over the coming quarters to change that positioning, to kind of be more convicted one way or the other? Yeah, it, it really does come down to, to order activity, uh, particularly in some of the larger areas. So one area that, would be, that I would want to make sure that we're uh, confident on would be um, mega projects, things like large EV plants, large battery plants, large oil and gas installations that are, have been driving their business and their outlook for the last couple of years. Given some of the shakings we've seen around uh, EV sales, given some of the areas you've seen about auto strikes being resolved with EVs and the crosshairs there, I'd love to see some of those larger projects remain on track. So, I mean, and I, and I, I, I do think so far so good, but um, as the as those new labor agreements uh, kind of come into play at the uh, big three, let's just make sure that their their large EV projects are are still going to happen in the next couple of uh, of years here. That will be one area that we'll be I mean, looking at. I mean. In, in some of the, the CHIPS legislation that's moved forward here just over the course of this year, you've got somewhere north or at least in the ballpark of $50 billion of it's, that's been earmarked for bringing on more capacity for CHIPS, more factories to produce these CHIPS and, and fabricate them. Do you believe that Caterpillar is, is a winner in the CHIP production space uh, or at least from the amount of chip production uh, that is set to come forward here simply because of the amount of factories that are going to need to come online? Yes, those those particular projects look very strong for the next uh, couple of years. I'd also add on to that uh, data centers with the growth in AR that we're seeing across the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of their power gen products and a lot of their other products help to power those projects too. So certainly those are areas of, of growth for them for sure. Michael, what did you like in the latest quarter from Caterpillar? Um, so besides the fact that some of their major end markets like construction in, the, in uh, the U.S. were up, they also uh, increased their free cash guidance for uh, 2023. They were expecting to be at the high end uh, of the four to eight billion dollars of free cash um, as of last quarter. This quarter, they actually expect to beat the high end of that eight billion dollar number. That's a really strong number. Um, they do expect to have again a strong 2024. There probably is some capital liquidation happening here, but it sounds like they can probably 
sustain it or 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 at least be very high uh, into uh, into our next year there. Michael Shilska, who is the DA Davidson Managing Director of Equity Research. Michael, great to have you here and get some of the analysis here on Caterpillar this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, we've got all your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back, everyone. We're live from the NASDAQ market site. The first major leadership test for Speaker Johnson is underway. House Republicans have introduced a plan to provide $14.3 billion in aid to Israel by cutting funding to the IRS. The bill also separates funding to Israel from the Biden administration's broader emergency funding request, notably omitting support for Ukraine. With more on why this is worth keeping on your radar, we've got Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Right. So uh, what the House Republicans are doing is they're saying, um, yes, we will agree to $14 billion in aid for Ukraine, but we think we need to uh, cover that cost. That money needs to come from somewhere. So where is it going to come from? And they're saying, let's just take it from uh, the IRS budget. In other words, let's ease up on tax cheats. Um, that is a pretty weird position. And Democrats control the Senate, and there's no way they're going to uh, agree to that. So this is kind of a statement of principle by House Republicans. Um, it's not going to pass in that form. So the question is, um, what happens next? Um, this will all go into negotiations at some point between the Senate and the House. There is a sense of urgency here uh, just because this this war is happening in front of the world's eyes in real time. Um, and uh, people in Congress do want to demonstrate, uh, you know, uh, robust support for Israel. So they're, I think they're going to have to move on this fairly soon. Um, just not clear what the, what the compromises are going to be. It, I would point out that what they also did in the House is they took out aid for Ukraine. They, they're saying, let's deal with that separately. The Biden administration says, nope, we want to deal with all this together. And that is a position of uh, Democrats in the Senate as well. So uh, negotiations underway. So, Rick, speaking of negotiation, talk to us about what this means for budget negotiations as we get closer to the government funding deadline. Well, business is underway again in the House. I mean, they are... Uh, back to work after almost a month off when they didn't have when Republicans didn't have a speaker. Uh, so um, I think what, what we're looking for. So what's going to happen with the budget? There probably will be another temporary funding bill when uh, the current one runs out. Uh, and then what um, Speaker Mike Johnson says he wants to do is he wants to do, do this the right way, fund the government through the 12 appropriations bills, which um, this is inside baseball for people who follow Congress. But 
Um, you know, more uh, appropriate budgeting pro processes. Um, so this is probably, the budgeting is probably going to get kicked into uh, 2024, and it, a pretty good chance we're not going to have a shutdown. If we do get to a crunch time again, it's, it's going to come uh, either in January or perhaps April of 2024. So we don't have to worry about that for now. Um, but um, just, you know, I think what the markets want is they just want to see the government functioning and not have to worry about this. So I think that's what the market is going to get in November. Whether it's going to continue in 2024 is a totally different question. This is true. We continue to come back to that kind of worry about what happens with negotiations with the budget time and time again and takes this right to the edge every single time. All right, Rick Newman with what's on his radar. Thanks so much, Rick. Hi, guys. All right, we've, take it easy. All right, we've got more of your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market side. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. They command multi-billion dollar empires and dominate the boardroom. I admit when I'm wrong. What you want to do is control your controllables. Decisions that impact your investments are made by them every single day. Profit and purpose go hand in hand. Now, Yahoo Finance grants you exclusive access to these titans of industry. Discover the motivations behind industry-altering decisions and the visionaries who imprint their legacy on the world's most renowned companies. Join us for our groundbreaking series, Lead This Way. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. We're about 30 minutes into the start of the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks are lower today as major averages head towards their third straight losing month. It was a tough October for investors as Treasury yields surged to multi year highs and earnings season kicked off with some shaky ground. Taking a look at individual names, BP reported a sharp year-over-year -year decline in profits in its third quarter, seeing $3.29 billion compared to $8.15 billion the year prior. Still, 
The British energy giant saw growth on a quarterly basis due to strong oil trading and higher refining margins. BP is still recovering from the sudden departure of CEO Bernard Looney, who resigned in September after admitting that he had not been, quote, fully transparent about relationships with colleagues. All right. And as COVID-19 vaccination rates dip, so do Pfizer's quarterly results and sales here. The pharmaceutical giant reported revenue down 42 percent on yearly basis and then a loss of 42 cents per share driven by a five and five point six billion dollar write off of COVID related inventory. The company did post a 10 percent rise in revenue from non COVID products, but the damage is done as Pfizer maintains the nine billion dollar cut it made to its full year sales outlook earlier in the month. Meantime, some turbulence in the skies for JetBlue. The air carrier reported a wider than expected loss in its third quarter and slashed its full year guidance. The company's CFO explained in a statement that, quote, the sheer magnitude of air traffic control and weather related delays has been staggering, end quote. JetBlue is also due in court today as the U.S. Department of Justice is attempting to block its planned $3.8 billion acquisition of Spirit Airlines. From skies to the ground, we've got some big news from Toyota today. The automaker announced that it is boosting its investment in battery manufacturing in the U.S. Now, of course, this comes after the company's chairman and former CEO Akio Toyoda said, quote, people are finally seeing reality that EV adoption will be an uphill battle. Here with the details of the new investment from Toyota is Yahoo Finance's senior autos reporter, Pras Subramanian. Pras? Hey, Diane. Yeah, so you know that you mentioned former uh, CEO and now Chairman Akio Toyota, once a skeptic. Now we're seeing that uh, kind of flipping here with Toyota doubling down on, on the EV space, or at least in the U.S., the automaker announcing expansion of that, of an EV investment at its North Carolina battery manufacturing plant by nearly $8 billion. Uh, that investment will add about 3,000 new jobs to this upcoming plant. Toyota says that the new investment brings a total outlay there to about $13.9 billion with 5,000 total jobs now at the place. So the new factory will make batteries for EVs and plug-in hybrids. And this comes after, like you said, the automaker said, had shown some ambivalence to full EVs. Uh, Akio Toyoda, once claiming the media is the one who wants EVs, and you know, the EVs going mainstream would take some time. Now, Toyota took some heat for that and would step down with former Lexus head Koji Sato taking over. Sato seen more as an EV realist, and the board agreed. Uh, now, this comes as we see GM and Ford here pushing back some of those investments. Toyota is now making, making some big investments, but it can be said Toyota was sort of behind when it comes to catching up with EVs. And in 2025 being this, the launch date for that, uh, that, that plant, it seems at that point, potentially EVs will be a bit more mainstream, or at least the tide will be turning, uh, which it slowly has been over the past couple of years. Pross, uh, this is huge here as we're continuing to watch some of the reaction here in autos. Pross, thanks so much for breaking this down for us. Really appreciate it. Well, everyone, switching gears here to some economic data coming out this morning, and we've got a new read on the consumer. Consumer confidence fell for the third straight month. The conference board's chief economist, Dana Peterson, saying consumers continue to be preoccupied with rising prices in general and for grocery and gasoline prices in particular here. To put some numbers on this announcement, uh, as the conference board has mm -hmm. said, the consumers remain pessimistic about the future, even as they continue to spend the consumer confidence index decline moderate in October to 102.6, that is down from an upwardly revised 104.3 right. during September here. And just further here, as Dana Peterson, the chief economist at Conference Board, had mentioned, October's retreat reflected pullbacks in both the present situation and expectations index yep. there, right in response to showing that consumers continue to be preoccupied with some of those rising prices in general, yeah. grocery, gasoline prices in particular. That's sticky inflation yeah. hitting consumers again, food and fuel again, top worries for households. But one thing that was also interesting to me that came out is uh, consumers being ex uh, concerned now about the political situation in general, higher interest rates, uh, what that ripple effect is. Of course, we're going to see that hit household balance sheets when you're talking about the price they pay for borrowing, whether it's their credit card um, or uh, if they're trying to get a mortgage, et cetera. Uh, and then just the interesting uh, piece that stood out to me is just the worries about war and conflicts mm -hmm. um, coming out, the recent turmoil in the Middle East. 
worrying households and, and it, you know what showed up here is just the decline in consumer confidence uh, conference board saying it's across households ages 35 and up so you know it's just it's not limited to lower to higher income it's across the board two things that consumers also think about here number one employment and what's the employment situation looks like and as it's noted here expectations for the next six uh, six months stay below the recession threshold of 80 reflecting a decline in confidence about the future business conditions job availability and incomes and continued skepticism about the future is notable given u.s consumers at least through the third quarter of this year continuing to spend heavily on both goods and service here but it still comes back to the employment situation. Slightly fewer consumers saying that jobs were plentiful compared to September, but the number saying that jobs were hard to get, uh, that also declined here. So that is noteworthy. And then just secondly here, the thought about, and for a consumer that's had to hear or think about or even say themselves the word recession over the past yeah. month here, more than two-thirds of consumers still said recession is somewhat or very likely in October here. Now, this is, uh, of course, a forward-looking expectation here, as uh, many times this is kind of on a six-month moving average basis. Uh, plans for purchasing, they can tend to fluctuate based on how consumers are viewing the possibility or the potential of a recession session as well. Yeah, that's something that stood out to me, too. In general, it seems like households are becoming a little more pessimistic. We'll see if it actually plays out by the numbers when we get into holiday shopping. And, yeah. and, because we've heard, uh, you know, analyst after analyst, commentator after commentator talk about just how strong uh, the American consumer is yeah. when it comes to, you know, just continuing to buy goods um, and even services. Maybe we'll see some cutback on services. Uh, but, you know, with the holidays upon us, goods may still have some strength there. But it's interesting to see in terms of the mood of consumers and how consumers are feeling. There's certainly more pessimism that we're seeing, whether we're looking at both by the numbers or the anecdotes that are coming out with regard to how they feel about the R word, recession. Um, and then the 12 month inflation expectations, they did increase. So annual inflation expectations increased in October. They had held steady for the past three months, but they ticked up a little bit to 5.9%. They'd held steady at 5.7% uh, for the past three months. So, you know, there is certainly some worries that are coming into play, what we're seeing from this latest print from the conference board. Yeah, uh, NRF expects consumers to spend on a household basis about $875 on average. So we'll see where that trickles through to some of the earnings as well as the economic data that we'll continue Indeed. to monitor for you, the viewer out there. All your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. 2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley week. Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation, mortgage rates, the diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it. November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance.
As we kick off the final trading day of October, the Dow and S&P 500 are on track for the third consecutive negative month. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is joining us for a trip down memory lane of the month that was. Jared? Yes, Diane, what's going on here? Because at the beginning of the month, I was saying we have uh, seasonality as a potential tailwind for stocks, but that's not how the uh, month is ending up here. We saw rates screaming higher, and that kind of got in the way of what might have happened anyway. Uh, let's take a look at the month that has been and almost is over. Dow is down about 1.77%, as you can see there. Uh, here's the high about mid-month. Mid -month. Here's the low only a few days ago. NASDAQ down the most, has down 3.5%, and the S&P 500 down just under 3%. And just a reminder, as of last Friday, we got another seasonality alert. Uh, this is from Ryan Dietrich. He's saying the average year for the S&P 500 bottoms today. That was last Friday. And here's a chart that shows you can see all the little squiggles here. There's a little bit of a dip into the end of October, and that's when the rest of the year takes off. I would say seasonality can definitely be in play here, but we have to have the interest rate situation under control. And here's a look at, I've been showing this chart for a couple months here. This is what the S&P 500 typically does for each month of the year, beginning with September through December. And that is, for instance, if you uh, invested only in the month of September going back to 1960, you can see this purple line would be losing money. Now, October is a net gainer. And you can see, uh, even though uh, we did not uh, come to fruition this month, typically that's what happens. And then you can see these other two lines up here. The orange one is November, the red one is December. Those are the most bullish uh, going back. Also want to talk about stocks. And uh, we were talking about Apple. And let me just chart what's been going on here. Apple has actually been down three months straight. And I, I focus on Apple and also Tesla because they're two of the most uh, widely watched stocks. And also, Apple happens to be the biggest one. Now, here's a candlestick chart. And you can see we are now in a downward, uh, downward sloping trend channel here. We just reached the bottom. We could very well see a pop to the top. But if we don't break out of this channel, I'm not going to think too much of it. So what do we have in store for the coming month? Um, how about some more seasonality plays here? I did this on I did this study on Apple a couple months ago, and I just want to show an update uh, for the month of October. Guess what? Usually up 750 uh, percent. Not usually. That is the actual going back to the beginning of uh, their uh, trading on the NASDAQ that would be invested in October. That would be up. That investment would be up 750 percent. But Apple is down about one, one and a half percent for the month of October. And for that matter, it's been down three months straight. So it bucks seasonality in August. Uh, it, in, it, I guess, embraced its seasonality, which is negative in September. In October, it bucked it once again. We'll have to see what happens in November or December. But you can see those tailwinds drop off dramat dramatically. So hard to say what's in store for the biggest stock in the solar system. Uh, but seasonality, even less of a tailwind right now. All right, Jared. Great analysis as always. Thanks so much here. We'll see what November holds indeed here. Switching gears, uh, let's talk a little Nike. In the new world of social media, Nike and Dove are launching a different type of partnership here. The two brands announced a joint venture, Body Confidence Sport. This is a tool aimed to coach girls age 11 to 17 to help build body confidence. Vanessa Garcia Brito, who is the Nike Chief Impact Officer, joins us now. Vanessa, great to speak with you as always here. First and foremost, I mean, we've seen some amazing partnerships over the year. And I think back to kind of some of those, Nike and, and Apple on the tech side, we've seen Nike and Gatorade in some instances. And so now Nike and Dove, the, the kind of subsidiary of Unilever here, what made this make sense and what's the broader initiative that, that is uh, looked to be driven forward from here? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me on. It's really great to see you. Uh, to kick off, you know, Nike really believes in the power of sport to move the world forward. And that means breaking down barriers for girls and women in sport. We've been doing that for decades and decades. But the reality is that girls today are falling out of sport at twice the rate as boys. Imagine that's 45 percent of girls ages 11 through 17 who are not staying in sport. That's a real problem. And so we knew that we needed to dig deeper to find some new solutions. Dove is a brand that shares our commitment to creating a world where 
girls feel confident and are getting all of the opportunities to fulfill their potential. So it made a ton of sense for us to team up and put body confidence forward out into the world. Vanessa, what's your strategy when it comes to social media around this? Because we know there's been, uh, social media has been under a microscope. In fact, uh, we know that recently Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, has been sued by states accusing the company of knowingly hurt, hurting teens with uh, just uh, the harm that um, social media can have on body image for uh, young girls, teens on social media. So what's your strategy when it comes to this partnership and how you showcase it on social media? You know, this issue about how we are talking to girls and frankly, all kids about their bodies goes beyond any format or um, area. So really it is about focusing on what their bodies can do versus what they look like, helping them understand how they can appreciate everything that their bodies are able to do and stop what we call body talk. You know, those that voice in your head that is telling you that your thighs are too big or that maybe you look great because you lost weight or all these other things that have much more to do with appearance than what your body is able to do. Frankly, that that it goes beyond whatever platform you're in. And it also goes beyond uh, any one person who's talking to kids, whether you come across them as a teacher, as a coach, as a friend, as a parent, you can help change that no matter what medium you're talking to them through. Vanessa, I mean, as much as we talk about how this has been the, the summer of Taylor Swift and Beyonce and Barbie, this has also been the summer of, of women's sport, too. You think about the success that we had seen with the Women's World Cup. Additionally, the WNBA finals that, that just wrapped up and the viewership that went into that. I mean, all of these things considered, there's been so much more focus now around women's sport, and it seems like it's continuing to grow. And this is also a good economic indicator as well here. So what type of investment do you expect us to continue to see, and how is that going to create more opportunities as well, both economically but also just, I mean, to have fun out there and playing sport at the end of the day too? And I'm going to pick up on a word that you just used, which is more. It is great to see more attention being given to girls and women in sport, um, as I mentioned, but girls are still falling out, so we need more and more of them to stay in to play. And not just because it's good for the future of sport, but it's because it's good for the future of society. And frankly, our day to day right now, we do need to be bringing more sport into our lives. Uh, and sport brings so much, so many other skills between how we connect with each other, how we connect with ourselves. Uh, we know that kids who are staying in sport are healthier, happier, do better in school. Uh, so it's just a really, it's one of those areas where, you know, truly more, more is more. Uh, Vanessa, I want to ask you about your plans for the holidays when it comes to, say, uh, just increasing sneaker culture, particularly when it comes to women and girls and just uh, helping that, you know, kind of proliferate more. Yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, there's a really fun holiday ahead. Uh, the season is filled with all sorts of uh, sneakers uh, and apparel that, I think people are going to really enjoy being out there buying for their friends and family. I myself, I'm I'm a runner, so I and I love to be recruiting uh, others to get out there running, and that includes my family. So on my own Christmas list, I've got the Nike React Infinity Run Four, uh, which does a couple of things that, that are pretty awesome. One, they look great. Uh, they feel fantastic. If you're a runner, you're getting 13% energy back. And for those of us who also want to be feeling good about how the planet is taking this in, it reduces carbon footprint by at least 43%. So, you know, that's a product that I hope other people will check out too. Uh, well, it's so funny. So I got my first pair of Jordans this year, actually. A friend, <laughs> yes, I did. You jumping higher out here in these streets? I'm not. I did not. I did not help me. <laughs> but, but to your point about, I was never a person who really embraced sneaker culture, and it was a friend of mine who was really into. She has the a huge collection of Dunks, and you know, just so. I got in this year, it was my first time. Uh, Vanessa, I'll let you have the last word. Is there anything else that you want to leave us with with regard to this campaign? I know Nike doesn't traditionally do a lot of partnership. Uh, so why, Dove, what's the last word? Yeah, so first of all, Dan, well, welcome to, to the sneaker culture and sneaker family, we're happy to have you. <laughs> Uh, last word is really check out Body Confidence Sport. 
uh, it's easy to find bodyconfidenceport.com. It if two big brands like ours are coming together to get behind girls, then we hope that many others out there will too. Frankly, everybody's got to get into her corner, and we're really happy to be doing this together with our partners. All right, thank you, Vanessa Garcia Brittle, Nike Chief Impact Officer. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. You got it. All your markets action straight ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. They command multi-billion dollar empires and dominate the boardroom. I admit when I'm wrong. What you want to do is control your controllables. Decisions that impact your investments are made by them every single day. Profit and purpose go hand in hand. Now, Yahoo Finance grants you exclusive access to these titans of industry. Discover the motivations behind industry-altering decisions and the visionaries who imprint their legacy on the world's most renowned companies. Join us for our groundbreaking series, Lead This Way. Navigating the post-pandemic world is difficult even for pharmaceutical leader Pfizer. Shares under pressure this morning after the company released its third quarter report. Uh, Pfizer posted its first quarterly loss since 2019 on weaker demand for its COVID-related products. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani has the breakdown for us. Good morning, Anj.
Good morning. Yeah, unfortunately, Pfizer is seeing a bit of that weakening demand for its COVID products, including the vaccine and Paxlovid. That uh, latter one, the, the treatment for COVID, we saw that change in what the company was going to be doing with the uh, with the U.S. government agreement. Shifting to that commercial market, they've had a $5.5 billion non-cash write-off there, and they're going to be using uh, some of the funds there from that agreement to support access for patients moving forward with a government-sponsored program. Uh, meanwhile, there's also uh, promising news for their RSV vaccine, the uh, one that just got approval and on the market, already $375 million there. Uh, got some uh, approvals of other vaccine, uh, other products, other indications that have come up there, meningococcal and adolescence, for example, vaccine, getting that approval, as well as uh, strong reports of their pneumococcal vaccine. So that that portfolio doing really well. Uh, meanwhile, they're still looking at two other near-term launches, uh, waiting on an FDA's decision for one of their prostate cancer drugs, as well as the mRNA flu vaccine. And then uh, there's, of course, that CGEN uh, approval from the FTC pending. They're waiting for that to close late 2023, early 2024. They already got the green light from the EU. So waiting on that. So that's sort of the full picture. As you can see, it's still sort of uh, recovering from its COVID days, if you will. That huge jump that they saw, of course, from the vaccine being the dominant player in the market and now having to sort of right-sized operations to focus on the rest of the company's portfolio. And that small ding from Q3, from that shift to the commercial market is what you're seeing right there. So uh, we'll wait to see. They did reaffirm guidance for the rest of the year. So we'll see how that pans out for the company. Yeah, we'll keep a close eye on Pfizer shares today. Another company that you've been watching as well, though, this week is Amgen, the company beating adjusted EPS, but just shy of topping Wall Street revenue expectations. You recently talked to Amgen CFO, the chief financial officer, Peter Griffith, on the company's results. What were some of the biggest takeaways from the quarter? Yeah, so Amgen, interesting, strong results there for that company. And, and they've sort of been a, a big cancer player, but sort of quiet about it for some time. We're just starting to see a lot of movement from that company and a lot more focus uh, you know, from there, uh, there was a bit of mixed, uh, you know, revenue outlook from, or sorry, mixed outlook from that company, especially because they're biosimilar for Humira, Amjavita, uh, that while sales were up, it's not as strong. It wasn't one of the revenue drivers, uh, as you might expect. So, so indicating sort of slow uptake. Uh, they also have that one drug that is now uh, under Medicare drug pricing negotiations. A uh, similar story with Pfizer, by the way. They both have uh, a drug that's being looked at. So, uh, you know, a lot of pressure from that as well. And just generally, you know, firming up that portfolio for what could be uh, a, a patent close down the line. So strong story there. Uh, I did talk to him also about their uh, their entering into the obesity space, weight loss drugs, of course, top of mind for a lot of us, and they are working on their products there. So interesting conversation. Listen to what Peter Griffith had to say about all of that. The highlights are strong execution, driving innovation at speed and scale across the enterprise. So first, we close the horizon uh, acquisition, brings to us a great rare disease business, which we're excited about. Uh, it shows that we look for the best innovation, whether it's internal, whether it's external. In this case, it was external. And secondly, we continue to rapidly progress uh, our organic pipeline. So we're very excited about that. And we're actually up to three uh, medicines now, potential medicines with breakthrough therapy designations. We added two to that category in the third quarter. But to get to your point on third, our volume growth was up 11% year over year. And we think that's evidence that physicians see a lot of value uh, in prescribing our innovative medicines to patients with serious and grievous illnesses all over the world. So that all led to 5% product sales growth in the third quarter. And underneath that was uh, earnings per share growth of 6%, up to $4.96 per share. So uh, we're very excited about that. And that momentum led us to raise our revenue guidance to $28.0 billion to $28.4 billion. 
for 2023. So all in all, strong execution, driving innovation at speed and scale at Amgen in the third quarter to serve patients. Peter, talk to me about Horizon. Now that it's part of the family, what can we expect moving forward for the add to the portfolio and guidance for 2024? Well, we're very excited, Anjali, about Horizon. We're excited about a rare disease business. And we are now together fully with them, the commercial forces working together. Uh, and so we're excited about creating some momentum going forward. So specifically on Horizon, the revenues were up 2% year over year in the quarter. And Tepeza, uh, their main uh, drug to treat thyroid eye disease, was up 2% quarter over quarter. And as we join together with them on Tepeza in particular. We look forward to bringing uh, what we've got at Amgen and helping increase the breadth and the depth of prescribers uh, for Tepeza, including into more of the general ophthalmologists, the endocrinologists. And we look forward to continuing to plan and roll out the international expansion of Tepeza. Tepeza. There are many patients all over the world with thyroid eye disease. And we think that's a, a key part of what we bring at Amgen uh, to help grow Tepeza going forward. Christexa, their medicine for chronic refractory gout, is, is annualizing now at a billion dollars. And Uplisna, which treats NMOSD, which is an autoimmune disorder affecting the optic nerve and the spinal cord, uh, that grew at 50% quarter over quarter. So we think there's momentum there. And we're just excited to be together with them. And we're excited for the medicines we're going to be able to help get to more patients and to more patients faster in the rare disease business. Absolutely. Definitely a strong space. And you mentioned some of those drugs that were part of the concern uh, for this uh, for this union, but glad it's all working out. Let's talk really quickly about obesity. That's an area that you're getting into and really has some hot competition. Where are we now? Well, despite all the discussions and analyses the past number of months, there's really a long ways to go in obesity uh, in understanding it and uh, approaching it. There'll be in any number of treatment modalities and any number of treatments that get developed for it. What I'm delighted to uh, announce is that we've completed enrollment in uh, meritabart cafraglutide, or we call it MARI, formerly AMG 133, uh, for the treatment of obesity uh, in phase two. And we've got over 570 patients in the cohort with and without diabetes. And, and so that's the center of the platform we want to build in obesity. We've got in phase one AMG 786, an oral approach. We've got an, any number of clinical, preclinical assets rather uh, in obesity. So it's still early in that game and a lot will happen. So as we look at our medicines, in, including MARI, uh, we're looking at how much weight comes off, uh, how fast does it come off? How long does it stay off? Um, what's the dosing regimen? Uh, and of course, in, the most important is safety and tolerability. So as obesity develops, we'll be looking at that. We expect top line data uh, from the uh, phase two trial of MARI uh, towards the end of 2024. And we've designed that phase two trial uh, in a way that creates optionality for us to create a broad uh, phase three trial when we get there, of course, depending on the data. So obesity is very important, public health crisis, uh, and Amgen is going to be a key participant in that, we believe. Definitely some similarities, as you can see from these two companies, both chasing that obesity space, both have uh, those uh, uh, the acquisitions uh, that are, have been of concern and, and really looking at patent cliffs. So uh, Big Pharma really in a big space right now to make some moves. Back to you guys. Oh, that's great stuff there. Anj Anjali Kamlani, we appreciate you for joining us this morning. We've got all of your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. 2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation. Mortgage rates. The diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. <laughs> Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it. November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance.
did. Microsoft is gearing up for the launch of its 365 co-pilot tomorrow, the company's latest push into generative AI, deeper, we should say. And our next guest says the tech giant could have an iPhone moment on his hands. Brent Braceland, Piper Sandler, co-head of technology research, cloud apps, and analytics joins us now. So Brent, take us through what about this makes it the iPhone moment for Microsoft. Sure, so if you think about um, the mobile movement and the smartphone movement, really, <clears throat> excuse me, rarely do you see uh, the largest companies actually monetize that opportunity. We're at basically this uh, juncture point here with generative AI, a, a new AI technology, where Microsoft is has a first mover advantage. It's the largest software company, one of the largest tech companies in the world. They actually have a first mover advantage. So similar to uh, iPhone and, and the opportunity that that brought for Apple, um, we see a similar opportunity where Microsoft, specifically with 365 Copilot, can really change the future of work. And so with this kind of embedded into how people could kind of take advantage of features around generative AI or the advances around generative AI, and then additionally where that would trickle through to Microsoft's bottom line, Wh which business do you expect would be best positioned to also unveil some type of competitive uh, answer to this? Because as of right now, it's been Microsoft that's been the early investor in open AI and thus seeing some of the benefits in chat GPT annexation there. Uh, one of the early companies that's been able to flow this into where different products could be beneficiaries of generative AI as well. Sure, so we're kind of in this, you know, 10, 11 month uh, uh, era since the launch of chat GPT uh, by open AI. Obviously Microsoft's a big investor there, has a 49% equity stake in open AI. But the real opportunity is bringing this into the hands of, a, of an enterprise user. Think of Microsoft 365 Copilot as personal productivity. It's your personal data. It's going to aggregate all of your emails, all of your meetings, um, and really bring personal productivity uh, into, uh, into the fold here. Uh, so far, they have roughly 40% of the Fortune 100 that is testing the, uh, the co-pilot technology. We're going to hear a lot more from some of these uh, paid preview users. There's over 600 of those all in uh, that uh, once this actually goes GA on Wednesday. So that's the opportunity. Um, they are kind of given their outsized position in the office space uh, for email and, and calendar. They're in a great position to do that. Obviously, Google is not that far behind with their own productivity tools for uh, G Suite. So Brent, uh, you just mentioned that, or you mentioned earlier that of course Microsoft has this first mover advantage. Uh, and then when you think about the trajectory for the scale of generative AI for Microsoft, uh, especially we're still in the early months of this new frontier, as you mentioned, less than a year um, into this. Uh, so what is the scale that you expect to see for Microsoft within the next year or so? Is this a 10X kind of thing? Yeah, great question. So if you think about GitHub Copilot, this is a coding companion for a developer. That's the most mature uh, generative AI product on the market today. Um, they have about a million paid users, uh, which is about a 200 million ARR business today. So it, it is still relatively small given the 100 million base of GitHub developers out there. Uh, that we think could be a $3 billion opportunity up from 200 million in ARR today over the next couple of years. If you look at the Azure AI opportunity, which is in the cloud and also includes open AI services, that's at about a $2 billion run rate again in, in nine months. So you're already looking at $2 billion run rate. We think this could easily be uh, a $10 billion uh, opportunity from a revenue perspective just within the next two years. Um, and ultimately we think this has the potential to be a hundred billion dollar opportunity for Microsoft. So yes, this is the next hundred billion dollar opportunity. Uh, similar to cloud, it took about 15 years for Microsoft cloud to become a hundred billion dollar business. We think we could get there in less than 10, uh, potentially 10 uh, for, uh, for Microsoft AI. So very big opportunity here for Microsoft. 
We, we talk so much about artificial intelligence or whether artificial intelligence is augmented intelligence or assisted intelligence. Uh, all, all of this considered, what type of displacements could there also be as, uh, as a result? And I only ask that because there's so much productivity that is set to be unleashed as well as a result. So yeah, I mean, this is a, the, the age old debate. Uh, will, uh, will Excel, um, you know, when it first came out, um, you know, obviate the need for finance professionals? It did not. Uh, it made those finance professionals much more productive and, and they repurposed their time. We think the same thing will happen with generative AI. Think of this as uh, creating superpower potential uh, for workers. Uh, imagine all the amount of uh, time we spend reading and looking at emails versus having a summary of the most important things in our email for us. So that's just uh, the, the beginning of what is uh, possible here with a generative AI. So we think this will absolutely uh, help improve productivity, help us basically become much more productive. Uh, yes, there's going to be certain jobs and certain functions of jobs that we do less, uh, but uh, ultimately, hopefully we're as humans going to be spending uh, more time doing uh, more productive things than, uh, than let's say, looking at and reviewing emails. So, uh, Brent, for Microsoft, there's clearly lots of blue sky when it comes to generative AI, but where are the clouds? What does the competition landscape look like that could kind of create headwinds for it being this iPhone moment, as you mentioned? Sure. So listen, Microsoft is not the only one that is uh, going after this opportunity. You see Google, you see uh, Meta, they're all kind of going at this in different uh, avenues. The advantage I think that Microsoft has is, is really one, they have a trusted relationship with the enterprise. And number two, they already have outsized market share in the office space, over 80% market share for, for, for Microsoft in the productivity space. Think email, calendar functionality. That is really what uh, what they bring to fold here and, and why M365 Copilot is so important. They have such a big entrenched footprint in that application space. Uh, that's why that launch uh, on tomorrow uh, is going to be meaningful. Um, there will be competitors. There were a lot of smartphone uh, competitors to, to iPhone as well, but ultimately that was a market that uh, that Apple capitalized on. Uh, if you look at the pace of innovation inside of Microsoft, they're looking to capitalize on this uh, generative AI movement as well. We'll see how it works, how it turns out. So far, we've been very impressed. Brent Bracelin, who is the Piper Sandler co-head of Technology Research, Cloud Apps and Analytics. Brent, always a pleasure to get some of your insights here. We're going to see how this plays out for sure. We appreciate it. You bet. Take care. Thanks. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. They command multi-billion dollar empires and dominate the boardroom. I admit when I'm wrong. What you want to do is control your controllables. Decisions that impact your investments are made by them every single day. Profit and purpose go hand in hand. Now, Yahoo Finance grants you exclusive access to these titans of industry Discover the motivations behind industry-altering decisions and the visionaries who imprint their legacy on the world's most renowned companies. Join us for our groundbreaking series, Lead This Way.
After cooling from pandemic era highs, the biotech sector is looking for its next big win. Weight loss drugs like Wagovi and Ozempic are grabbing headlines, but one biotech firm sees major potential in an older experimental heart disease drug. Now, CTP blockers were once all the hype for large drug makers, helping to increase good cholesterol in the body to treat heart disease. But they were discarded by the likes of Pfizer, Eli Lilly, and others when early trials failed to take off. That's right. But biotech firm New Amsterdam Pharma sees major potential. RBC Capital Markets agrees, saying this drug could succeed where others have failed, representing a multi-billion dollar opportunity. They initiated coverage over at RBC Capital Markets as well on New Amsterdam Pharma with an outperform rating and a $25 price target earlier this month, seeing potential in the firm's cholesterol drug. Joining us now, we've got Leonid Tomashev, who is the RBC Capital Markets Biotechnology Analyst. Take us into your thesis around this and, and why people's focus should be on New Amsterdam Pharma, perhaps. Great. Well, th thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Um, love to walk you through New Amsterdam. You know, I think, as you mentioned, biotechs had a tough tape. Um, but as far as biotech company goes, we think that New Amsterdam is actually a pretty straightforward company to understand. So, as you mentioned, there were a number of CTP inhibitors in the past, many of which were, have failed. But we have a very good handle on why we think those failed. And we think that obesetropib, which is New Amsterdam's lead drug, is a best-in-class molecule. It's more potent, it has better pharmacological properties, and not only does it raise the good cholesterol, as we talked about, but it also reduces the bad cholesterol very meaningfully. And the drug has been in six phase two trials, all of which have shown 40 to 50% reductions in the bad cholesterol. Now, it's been tried as a monotherapy, it's been tried as a combination with statins, with other drugs. So it's really gone through the ringer of different trials that it can go through, and it's worked, and it's been very consistent. And one of the most well understood character, uh, correlations in medicine is that lowering the bad cholesterol decreases the rate of heart attack and strokes and negative cardiovascular outcomes. So we feel pretty confident that with this 40 to 50% reduction in the bad cholesterol, New Amsterdam can succeed in a large phase three trial to show a reduction in negative cardiovascular outcomes. And that's going to be coming in the second half of 2026. And then just to touch on the unmet need here, I mean, I think you don't need a lot of introduction to know that heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. And in fact, it's the leading cause of death worldwide. Now, up to 50% of patients can't reach their target cholesterol even when they're on medicine. And so we think that obesetropib as a once daily effective and competitively priced bill can reach over a billion dollars in sales in the U.S. and be a multi-billion dollar drug worldwide. Uh, I, I want to ask you, for um, this class of drugs, CTP in inhibitors, um, what about it makes it a winner now, really, when you think about these other companies that have dropped it? Um, Amgen originally had this drug, gave up on it. Um, we listed a, a whole host of other companies that did. What is it about now in this moment and where it is in terms of the research and development? Yeah, yeah, I think I think the field has advanced over the past 10 to 15 years, and we've really understood what happened to those prior drugs. So originally, the hypothesis with CTP inhibitors was that if you lower, if you increase the good cholesterol, that should be enough to improve cardiovascular outcomes. Now, today, we're not quite sure that's correct. And so the first generation of CTP inhibitors, they were really focused on increasing the good cholesterol. And many of them didn't reduce the bad cholesterol quite as much as we'd like to see. So that drove uh, at least one of the failures. Pfizer's drug um, had blood pressure issues. So blood pressure is another thing that correlates to negative cardiovascular outcomes. And so when their drug increased blood pressure, um, patients did badly. Um, and then, you know, the most interesting story is actually Merck's drug actually succeeded on its phase three trial. And it showed improvements in cardiovascular outcomes in addition to lowering the bad cholesterol. But the drug had a chemical issue where it would actually accumulate in the fat of, of people. And so you'd stop taking the drug, but you'd still have the drug in your system for, for two years. And that really wasn't acceptable for a commercial product. Now, obesetropib doesn't have any of these issues. It's the most potent bad cholesterol lowering drug. It's got 
doesn't accumulate in fatty tissues. And so we think that this is really the one that's got the best shot of success here. And then speaking of that success, is there the potential in your view for this to be that blockbuster drug moment like Lipitor was previously? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going to be hard and somewhat challenging to ever match what the statins were. You know, those were almost a, a first in class uh, heart disease drug. But we definitely think that this can be a blockbuster. You know, when they launch, they should have their cardiovascular outcome data in hand. That means that reimbursement will go faster. Physicians and patients will all know exactly what this drug can do. You can add it on top of your current medication. In certain populations, perhaps you can use it as monotherapy. So we think there's a lot of different ways to use it. It's a once daily oral pill. It'll be easy to take and it'll potently reduce cholesterol. It won't be an injection like some of the other drugs on the market now. So we think it's got a profile that can really make it a multi-billion dollar drug. All right, so could this be New Amsterdam Pharma's uh, Lipitor moment? We shall see. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Leonid Tomashev, uh, RBC Capital Markets Biotechnology Analyst. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right, we want to do a quick check of the markets uh, for, day, for today in the early trading as we take a look at where things are. Um, we've got a mixed market, pretty muted uh, as we round out October. We've got the Dow off a bit, just uh, less than a tenth of a percent. The S&P 500 holding on to a gain of a tenth of a percent. So we're seeing a pretty range-bound market, NASDAQ off a few points as well, uh, just off eight points, less than, way less than a tenth of a percent. So we got a flat market there. Yeah, communication services, the big laggard as of right now. However, you do have more gainers than laggards. Real estate is leading the charge. That's up by about 1.1% right now. That's all for us today from Brad Smith, Diane King Hall. We've got much more coming your way at the start of the 11 a.m. hour. It's going to take Fujita and Rochelle Akufo will take over the reins here. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's what we're watching this morning. A spooky end to October. The Dow and the S&P 500 are on track for the third consecutive negative month, marking the first three-month losing streak for the indexes since March of 2020, a more gloomy times ahead. And crude awakening. The World Bank warns oil prices could spike to more than $150 a barrel, saying an expansion of the Israel-Hamas war will lead to a large disruption. This is Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu rejects calls for a ceasefire. Plus, deepening debt while credit scores are hitting an all-time high. Spiking prices led households to increasingly rely on credit cards. But with heightened geopolitical tensions and the revamp of student loan repayments, can the consumer bounce back? We'll discuss. First, though, let's take a look at the markets. We are 90 minutes into the trading day. A pretty flat day today as we see the Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ just right uh, above that flat line there. The S&P 500 up about eight points and the Dow up... 14 points. In terms of sectors, we are watching real estate seeing the biggest gain so far with communication services, the big laggard on the day. But of course, Treasury yields in focus as we see the FOMC meeting kick off over in D.C. You see all the, the short end as well as the long end sort of pulling back right now. The 30 year yield right at 5%. Well, despite a small bounce back in Monday's trading session, the major averages are on track to end their third consecutive month in the red. This marks the first three-month losing streak for the Dow and S&P 500 since March of 2020. We've got Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to break down the moves for us today. Jared, where do we go from here? Akiko, hopefully up, but that was a story one month ago because October was supposed to be a bullish month as well. Those surging interest rates, uh, they just got out of hand and they put a damper on equities. But let's take a look at uh, what Almanac Trader believes is in store for the month of November, historically on the Wi-Fi Interactive here. Um, stocks tend to end November strong. Now, let me just read the narrative. First of all, we have a purple line. That's what the S&P 500 typically does in the month of November. And then we have what the S&P 500 does in pre-election years. That's the four-year presidential cycle. You can see the cyan line that I'm tra tracing out at the bottom here is a bit lower and basically goes sideways a lot of the month. So let me just read what uh, Jeff Hirsch over at Almanac Trader is saying about the month of November. Being a bullish month, November has seven bullish days based on upon S&P 500 with four occurring in the first five trading days of the month. This bullish stretch is visible in November's seasonal chart with solid gains spanning the first six trading days. Now, following a strong open, the market has tended to drift sideways uh, with some chop through mid-month and into the Thanksgiving holiday before rallying strong into the end of the month. Although historically a bullish month, November does have weak, pain, uh, weak points. So the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000, not shown there, exhibit the greatest strength at the beginning and end of uh, November. In pre-election years, performance in November has been a bit softer, but full month performance remains positive on average. Now, let me just show you what this looks like in terms of the VIX. VIX has uh, seasonality as well. This uh, is something I compiled that goes back all the way to uh, the beginning of VIX calculation in 1990. The purple line is what the VIX has done this year. And you can see right now we're coming off a high, which was not as high as the March uh, I guess, incident which we had with the internet banking panic. Uh, but you can see we actually peaked a little bit late there, and that's when we had that drop off towards the end of this month in stocks. Now, going forward, you can see in the cyan line, uh, we drift down into year end before a little bit of a bounce, a little bit of a bounce there. But if this holds true, if we have seasonality as a tailwind, that does favor the bulls for stocks. But I will give my warning here that uh, treasury rates, especially yields in the 10-year, I'm going to put those on here. Those have been flirting with 5%. If we do get that surge above, let's say to 5.5%, all bets are off, guys. Indeed. Appreciate that update. Didn't get the uptober we were hoping for. We'll see what November holds for us. Appreciate that update. Well, it's been a spooky season for stocks as major averages head for a third consecutive month of declines, pushing even the most bullish investors to cut their forecasts. Oppenheimer's John Stoltzfus lowered his year-end S&P forecast to 4,400 from 4,900, and strategist Ed Yardini said that the index probably won't recoup the 10% drop from its July peak before year-end. 
So as earnings season blazes on, and of course the Fed makes another interest rate decision, should investors run to safety? Let's bring in Keith Bliss, Blocks Cross Global Head of Markets and Strategy. Thank you for joining us this morning. So Keith, what is the move here? Where do you invest in this sort of volatile market? Well, right now, uh, and, and Jared actually stole some of the things that I was going to uh, talk about uh, today. Uh, it, Jared and I uh, speak quite often in, in compare notes, but right now, uh, I think the setup is to go long equities across the uh, across the broad uh, platform in in construction inside of cash equities in in the U.S. Uh, a lot of the things that we were talking about with seasonality do hold up. Patterns repeat themselves. And we've had the broad market indexes, mostly the S&P and the NASDAQ, in oversold reading since the middle of last week with the quantitative models that we that we design and we and we look at and we structure and follow the markets with. At the same time, the VIX has gotten overbought. So when you have that set up, you have the seasonal factors in play, you have reversion to mean trades that are that are primarily driving the market right now. Uh, I think you can get long uh, U.S. equities here, despite the sell off that we've experienced in in October. So, Keith, let's kind of break down that play. I mean, if you are going long U.S. equities, what sectors right now hold the most value? Well, the sectors that are the most oversold right now are the healthcare, specifically the biotechs. Uh, if you look at some of the NASDAQ biotech indexes, they've been persistently and painfully oversold for some time. I'm not sure I'd start dabbling a lot of money in there because I really don't see a, a, an extreme bounce back coming. Those stocks are down for a variety of reasons, but mostly around uh, regulation, inflation is impacting them, as well as uh, innovation, which is coming into some of the names, as well as FDA approval. Uh, the banks are another place you may look. They have been persistently oversold. But again, that is a an economic play that people are, are concerned about, have been for most of the year. So I think if you got into metals and mining, uh, if you got into some of the uh, commodity space, oil is has been oversold, and, and certainly we would expect that to lift. Uh, especially if geopol if the geopolitics continues to heat up in the in the, in the war in the Middle East, unfortunately, if that expands, that will certainly drive uh, commodities prices. Those are the places that I would look at, as well as general industrial uh, types of names. Caterpillar reported today, and their earnings were not great, but they they see that they are going to be growing uh, into the future. So, uh, I think that's a name that you could get in on good value. Uh, certainly, value names are the place to go right now, Kiko. The the growth indexes have just been hammered recently because people are concerned about growth. Maybe not through the end of the year. The economic data is, has been good, despite what most uh, most uh, analysts would tell you is going to happen in the future. But I would say we're from growth names, going to value names, consumer durables, and things of that nature. And Keith, you mentioned geopolitics as one of the risks here. And it, it did take months for markets to really even come to terms with what the Fed was consistently saying about a higher for longer rate environment. What do you think are some of the risks that the market is still discounting at this point in the year? Well, I think they're still discounting the overall inflation picture. Uh, we're starting to see the cracks in the consumer, um, as you just reported or will re be, be reporting. Consumer debt is, is lifting. Uh, Desaving has been going on. Uh, all you have to do is go to one of your local uh, uh, merchants and see the increase in prices, especially still around food inflation. It's it's pretty dramatic uh, if you go to your grocery store or even to a Costco or Sam's Club or things of that nature. Um, so I think the market is still discounting what the inflation picture is going to look like. And then by extension, what the rates picture uh, becomes into 2024, maybe even 25. And as a result, what it will do to force the Fed's hand. Um, you know, Rochelle, the, the stock market hates two things, uh, mostly, and that is an increasing rate environment and a lack of earnings. And generally, they go hand in hand, especially in the financial sectors. So the market's not really come to grips with that. As it relates to geopolitics, uh, with the situation going on in Israel and Gaza is different from Ukraine from the standpoint that the, the flare up in that region moving into a full shooting war incorporating other uh, players in that region, maybe even the U.S., that has the impact of spilling over across a wider area of the region and then impacting the most valuable commodity we have on the globe right now, which is oil. Um, so that's why I think people are paying more attention to what's going on in Israel than they did with what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, and those are things that we're going to have to keep an eye on. How long this lasts? How Does it spill over? Does it impact our ability to produce oil? Uh, what happens to the oil markets. And of course, as we know, if oil does get up to $150 or higher, 
a barrel as a result of this, then that just ripples down through all economies and inflation. And that will be very bad for the consumers globally. And then as a result, very bad for cash equities. Keith, bringing the conversation back to the U.S., we've got a House speaker in place now, but we're a few weeks out from another deadline, November 17th, of a potential government shutdown. How big of a risk do you think that is for the market? Tough to tell right now. We'll see what happens with uh, Speaker Johnson and how well he's able to negotiate, not only with his own caucus, but also with the White House uh, to avoid something like this. I mean, the mere fact that we got a speaker, I think, was finally a result of uh, the politicians, especially the Maverick politicians in the Republican conference, looking at the polling numbers and seeing that Americans were frustrated and tired of this nonsense going on down there, put a speaker in place so they can start doing our business again. Um, but as it relates to the conversations around increasing the debt ceiling and therefore keeping the government open, uh, I, I think we're still, you know, not on firm footing when it comes to those negotiations. Again, those mavericks that delayed us putting a speaker in place, they're still going to, you know, gird for the war that's coming on this. They want spending to stop. They want the deficit uh, to be decreased and cut. Um, and okay. continually raising the debt ceiling, especially with the spending programs that have been put in place the last three years, that's going to be a tough, tough negotiation. So I think, like they do every time, they'll walk us right up to the brink. Uh, we'll probably get another continuing resolution. Uh, but up until that point, you can expect markets to gyrate, especially as we get closer to that deadline. Indeed. Well, appreciate you joining us this morning with your insights. Keith Bliss, Blocks Cross Global Head of Markets and Strategy. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, the World Bank out with a warning this morning, saying any escalation in the fighting between Israel and Hamas could push oil to record high prices. This as we approach a month into the war with no ceasefire in sight. Joining us now is our very own Inez Ferre. Inez, I know there are a couple of scenarios that have been laid out here. Yeah, that's right, Rochelle. And this is part of an outlook report that the World Bank put out about commodities and three risk scenarios. And you mentioned it. And these are the risk scenarios that the World Bank is looking at. One is a large disruption scenario if the uh, conflict in the Middle East escalates. This is also on top, of course, of the war that's happening in Ukraine. And in that case, the World Bank says that the global oil supply would fall by six to eight million barrels per day. And that would drive up prices to between $140 and $157 per barrel. That would be a record. In a medium risk scenario, uh, that would be, or a medium disruption risk scenario, I should say, crude would reach $109 to $121 per barrel. And the case of a small disruption, oil prices would increase by a range of $93 to $102 per barrel. Now, why is this important? Well, because when you see a rise in oil prices, of course, you see a rise in many other services and goods, and one of them being food inflation. And the World Bank is focused on this, the issue of food inflation and how that would impact developing countries. So it's saying if you do see this oil disruption, expect food prices to go higher and uh, for that to impact these developing countries. Now, under the bank's baseline outlook, uh, they are saying that crude will average $90 per barrel this quarter, and it will fall to $81 a barrel next week as the global economy slows. Right now, we're looking at WTI crude prices that are just above $82 a barrel. Brent crude's above $87 a barrel. And we have seen quite a bit of volatility since the war in the Middle East broke out, and with oil prices fluctuating, going up and down over the last several weeks. The report also is pointing out that you are seeing that the conflict has had a modest impact on commodity prices. And part of this is just because of the global world uh, supply of oil that now we are getting oil as opposed to, for example, in the decade of the 70s, uh, oil is coming from different parts of the world. You also have individual countries that have reserves. And then you also have a less of a dependency on uh, oil as countries, some countries are going green. Okay, a warning out there. Uh, looks like we're back to talking about $100 a barrel or more. Uh, Inez Ferrey, thanks so much for that. Thank you. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, the Federal Reserve kinking off its two-day policy meeting today. Investors largely expecting the FOMC to keep interest rates steady this time, but they will be watching very closely for any hints of where rates can go from here. Joining us now with what to expect, we've got Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomberger. Jen. Good morning, Akiko. That's right. Fed officials meeting right now here in Washington in the first of their two-day policy meeting where they're widely expected to hold interest rates steady in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent. With no new interest rate projections and no major changes to the policy statement expected, all eyes will be on Fed Chair Jay Powell for what he says in his press conference and what he guides for monetary policy. How much long-term bond yields have soared is likely to feature prominently in officials' discussions about whether another rate hike is still needed and how long the central bank will hold rates around current levels. On the one hand, inflation measured by the Fed's preferred gauge, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, showed inflation slow to 3.7 percent in September, hitting the Fed's expectations for where inflation would end this year. That's down from 4.3 percent in July and around 4.6 to 4.7 percent for much of the first half of this year. This as bond yields have soared. All of this arguing for a pause. On the other hand, economic data have come in hot. GDP in the third quarter sizzled to nearly 5%, driven in large part by consumer spending. The employment cost index also clocking in higher than expected on wage growth this morning. All of that arguing that more might need to be done in the future. Ahead of the meeting, Powell said the central bank would proceed cautiously given uncertainties, risks, and how much the Fed has already hiked rates. But he warned that inflation is still too high and that more interest rate increases are possible if the economy or the job market stay surprisingly hot. Powell expected to continue walking that tightrope tomorrow between moving cautiously but still keeping interest rate hikes on the table to reserve optionality in the wake of hot economic data. Guys? And, and we know that lag is also a part of this. So how much are the Fed's rates really hitting the economy at this point, given that consumers have low fixed rate mortgages? Great point, Rochelle. Nearly 80% of consumers are sitting on fixed rate mortgages right now below 5%. They've got jobs. So that pertains for more spending to continue and continue this cycle. On the other side, on the business side, you've got corporations that have financed their bonds and are sitting in low fixed rates as well for as long as eight years. So business is also sitting on cash. So there's a large swath of this economy that may be interest rate immune at this point, making the Fed's job of using that blunt interest rate tool more difficult. And you heard Fed Chair Powell last week say that this economy is still seeing strong demand. Indeed. Appreciate that update. A lot of eyes will be on the Fed tomorrow and the rest of this week. Jennifer Schomberger, thank you so much. Thanks. Well, tomorrow, the Federal Reserve will announce its November interest rate decision. Now, markets are largely predicting officials will keep rates unchanged yet again. But much less certain is the Fed's future policy. And the data-dependent Fed has much more to consider than just inflation. Escalating geopolitical tensions and a looming government shutdown all place additional pressure on officials navigating an already complex economic environment. Joining us now is Cindy Beaulieu, Conning Chief Investment Officer for North America. Thank you for joining us joining us this morning. So obviously, we're largely expecting the Fed to keep rates unchanged. What are some of the commentary that you're going to be honing in on when we hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell? Sure. Thank you, Rochelle. Great to be here. So tomorrow, yes, we agree that the call is going to be unchanged from the Fed's perspective. And for the reasons you mentioned, a lot of uncertainty in the world still. Hard to believe three years post-COVID, there's still uncertainty, but we seem to keep finding new ways to uh, bring it forward and create more volatility. What we're really watching for is how concerned they are continue to be about inflation. You know, 
Core PCE at 3.7% is certainly encouraging and it's moving in the right direction, but the easy work on inflation is done. And there is some persistency to the inflation that we're seeing today. And given the type of print we just saw with GDP in the third quarter, it's likely that this next move lower to get to their 2% target is going to be harder and take more time. So the vigilance around inflation is something that we want to hear from him as to whether or not he will be as strong and hawkish on that as he has been in the past. And then what are they seeing on the labor market, which we think is also a good reason why they should pause tomorrow as well. We got a very big print for September non-farm payrolls. We expect that gets revised away. And the Fed is likely going to try to look through to gather more data and maybe at the December meeting have enough. But right now we want to hear what they're thinking about the labor market and how concerning is it that it's still relatively tight for their liking. Yeah, Cindy, to your point, we have seen recent economic data point to inflation continuing to be sticky, but we've also seen the rates uh, on uh, bond or bond yields um, certainly push higher. I mean, marching towards that 5% on the longer end, we've seen it at 5%. How does that complicate the calculation for the Fed, you think? So it's interesting. You, you, we've heard a number of Fed governors talk about how that actually may make their job a little easier, um, that if rates can stay at these higher levels, it does the Fed's job for them. We've seen the 10-year test 5% several times, and it has not been successful in sustaining that level, which maybe tells you a little bit about all of the uncertainty that's out there and the different factors that are coming into play as rates are rising. But the fact that we are seeing rates rise does ultimately make it easier for the Fed to be less vigilant um, with their rate increases and allow the markets to do a little bit of work for them. But they need to see that sustained, and we're not getting that right now. We do believe a lot of the pressure that's happening in the bond market is also reflecting the fiscal side of the situation, which is not good. Uh, we do have a large deficit that did increase again. We obviously have a lot of treasury issuance at a time when you have to question who's supporting that. And that is definitely factoring into pushing rates higher, particularly on the longer end of the curve. And so in expectations for December, if we do get that rate hike, is this going to be a slow and steady push here? Or we know that obviously uh, Chair Powell has said, look, they want to nip it in the bud. They don't want to sort of go easy on inflation and then have to revisit and, and upset things all over again. How aggressive should the Fed be then in December? Uh, we believe it would be just another 25 basis point increase if the data supports that when we get to that point in time. And then they can really fully go on this hold that we do expect. We've been a subscriber of rates higher for longer through this whole cycle. We see the reason for it, given just the stickiness, stubbornness of inflation and the various sources of it. So I think you know for the December meeting, 25 makes sense and then the hold. There are some factors that the Fed has to be monitoring very carefully beyond those they're already dealing with today. Certainly, as I mentioned, the fiscal situation, if we do ultimately get to a budget agreement, that could prove to add to inflation again if there's excessive amounts of spending that are built into that budget plan. And the other side of it is the geopolitical conflicts. Wars are by their nature inflationary. They can you know, kind of bring inflation in from a couple of different sources. Oil is a little bit different this time from prior cycles because there are alternatives to it in terms of where it can be sourced from, but it doesn't change the fact that we still rely very heavily today on Middle Eastern oil. And so uh, the fact that we're looking at possible escalation of a conflict in that region of the world is a bit problematic. Another reason why the Fed holds now, but maybe by the time we get to December, they have a little bit more clarity there and can use that as they think about their next rate decision. Cindy, this is a Fed that is still divided, though. We've heard uh, some more dovish members uh, of the FOMC, those like Austin Goolsby as well as Rafael Bostic, uh, really warn about the lag factors from the Fed policy. You're calling for another 25-point basis hike. Um, is the economy strong enough to support that when you factor in that the full effect of these hikes we've already gotten hasn't taken effect yet? I, I think that that's very true in terms of the lags with which monetary policy does have an impact. And the lags this time are a little bit longer. And that really comes from the fact that we've had an unbelievable amount of liquidity built into the system, way more than it needed. Uh, you think back to the period before COVID when we had such low rates for such a long period of time, and that's allowed so many homeowners in the U.S. to have mortgage rates that are just really attractive for them to hold on to and no reason to move. 
move. Then you had three different stimulus packages that allowed for a lot of consumers to be very comfortable in their homes. But today, at the end of the day, we're looking at a country where more than 50% of the people have less than $1,000 in the bank right now, and that's concerning as well. So I think the Fed, part of the reason why they've been careful in their pauses along the way here has been because we have seen so many um, so many uh, lag effects in this that have taken place, and that's that's why they're being cautious and careful. But I think the problem they have now is that their 2% target is not in reach. 3.7 is great, but it's still not 2 and it's looking like even by their own forecast that they won't achieve 2% even by this point next year. So I, I think the battle is real inside the room over these next two days. It's not as easy to get the consensus as he's had before. But for right now, it does seem like the inflation battle still remains at front and center. But they take a pause here and wait for more data. Hey, we'll be listening uh, for a Fed chair's comments tomorrow. Cindy Bullew, Conning, CIO North America. Good to talk to you today. Thank you. Nice to talk with you as well. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Chipmaker AMD is set to report its third quarter results after the bell today, though NVIDIA has become far and away the one to beat when it comes to AI chips. There's some optimism on the street about AMD's prospects and in artificial intelligence. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance senior tech reporter Ali Garfinkel with a preview. Ali. Hi, Akiko. So the race to catch NVIDIA is on, and AMD is looking for a boost here today. Now, the company is a little bit tricky to assess right now, though, because on one hand, there's near-term uncertainty as to how the company is going to perform. Consider macroeconomic pressures, and of course, NVIDIA's dominance really weighing on AMD and other names in the sector. That said, on the other hand, there is a lot of optimism about how is AMD is going to be performing in the back half of 2024. So in the call today, keep an eye on how AMD talked about new products like data center chip and its plans for 2024 as the company really looks to the long term. A lot of analysts are saying that there's actually an appetite for that kind of engagement with NVIDIA's back half of 2024, early 2025 plans. Nali, of course, in the thick of earnings season, the Biden administration recently imposing further restrictions on chip makers like AMD and NVIDIA when it comes to selling in China. What can you tell us about that? Rochelle, so the goal of the restrictions, broadly speaking, is to limit Chinese military capabilities. Now, these curbs were supposed to come into effect 30 days after October 17th. 
However, they are coming into effect early. Now, while names like AMD are affected here, NVIDIA, of course, again, really is in the crosshairs. Through the entire, the result here is going to be that reportedly $5 billion worth of NVIDIA chip orders are now in limbo. NVIDIA is saying in SEC filings that it is not expecting to see earnings affected in the near term. However, the restrictions are expected to affect data center revenues over time. So it's something investors should definitely keep an eye on. Watch for SEC filings and when NVIDIA reports earnings in a few weeks. It's definitely something to see if they discuss. Okay, the market certainly going to be watching this one closely. Ali Garfinkel, thanks so much for that. Well, the tech world remains enthusiastic about the possibilities of artificial intelligence, but the rapidly evolving tech continues to raise concerns globally. President Joe Biden unveiling his plan to regulate AI on Monday, unveiling an executive order that aims to monitor threats posed by artificial intelligence, protect consumer privacy, and create the best practices on AI's role in our justice system. To discuss this, let's bring it uh, on the future of generated AI. Let's bring in Jeffrey McGregor. He's TruePix CEO. And Jeff, we should point out that your company uh, for years has really been trying to tackle uh, distortion of images, we should say, um, that's partly created by AI as well. But let me just get your reaction to what was unveiled by the White House yesterday. Knowing what you know in terms of the content that's out there right now, um, how comprehensive is this? Akiko, it's great to see you. And look, let me let me just start by saying that I want to live in a world where when I'm scrolling through my news feed or looking at social media or doing anything else online, I know if images are created by computers or if they're created by humans and whether I should trust them or not. And I think that's fundamentally important. And what the EO does is it starts to align incentive structures for big tech to adopt technologies that do create this kind of visibility for consumers around the origin of content, the history of content, and allows them to make decisions on whether they should trust that content that they're consuming. And I think that's critically important at this stage as AI continues to accelerate, it continues to create challenges in terms of trusting the information we're consuming, and we need the right incentive structures to be able to create adoption of the technologies that exist today. So, Jeffrey, what would those incentives look like in the space of authenticating digital content? And how might we also see that show up as a consumer? I know putting watermarks on some of these uh, images and content has been one of the suggestions from the White House. Look, I think, I think social media companies in particular have proven over the years that Sometimes financial incentives don't always match the incentives for consumer safety and health. And in this case, I do think regulation plays a very important role in urging these companies to adopt technologies that do exist today that do help consumers make more informed decisions. And to your second question, the way that this manifests is a very simple icon that starts to appear on images and videos that we see online. It's called content credentials. And content credentials, when you tap on that icon or scroll over it with your mouse, you'll essentially see verified cryptographically secured information <clears throat> on where that content originated from, what the history of that content is, and ultimately if it's been generated by computers or if it came from a camera and it's an authentic human creation. And on that point, Jeff, uh, TruePic is kind of at the heart of that technology, right? In terms of being able to authenticate the images that are out there. Um, you recently had an announcement where you developed this chip with Qualcomm that will be implemented in all Qualcomm, uh, all phones that use the Qualcomm chip. But, but I'm curious when you think about the scale of the problem right now. I mean, how much of a dent can you make just based on your technology knowing how much content is out there right now? It, it's a great question, Akiko. It's candidly, it's an all out race, right? AI is moving extremely quickly. And part of why we're so excited about that Qualcomm partnership that you mentioned is it really does drive scale to this idea of content transparency. The vast majority, 85% plus of digital images that are captured are captured on smartphones. So if we're authenticating genuine, real content at the smartphone layer, we have the ability to drive tremendous scale in terms of labeling content that is indeed trustworthy. 
Now, as it pertains to generative AI, we fully anticipate that generative AI will happen at the edge and leverage the compute power on smartphones for cost savings purposes and labeling Gen AI content, again, on chip with Qualcomm is a massive step forward in being able to drive scale to consumers. So they start seeing that icon as they're scrolling their media feeds and just ultimately consuming information online. And Jeffrey, what does this mean for creators in this space? Obviously, being able to track original content or how AI is sourcing content from other creators, how does this add some transparency to that? I, I think that's the right word. I think it's all about transparency. And AI, I believe, is a, a massively positive tool, both for society, but also for creators. And if creators have the ability to label content that comes from them, and the changes that they've made and how they've used AI in creating a uh, any piece of creative work or art, all of that is very positive and helps enable creators uh, from an ownership and attribution standpoint in a way that, that I think will behoove them long-term. Uh, really quickly, Jeff, I know you've done some work with the UN in the past. Uh, there's been a lot of concern around the disinformation, misinformation that's coming out in this Israel-Hamas war with those images, which ones are doctored, what not. I'm curious, based on what you know, what you have seen, um, what that tells you about how significantly this tech is expanding. I mean, ha have you seen a lot of that coming out of the region? Absolutely. And I think it, it shows that there's a, a failure in our ability to detect whether images are genuine and where they came from after the fact, which is why approaches like TruePic that take a preventative approach in, in marking content at their origin are really important on the global stage. And we ultimately believe image transparency has significant value when in humanitarian crises, in any non-permissive or non-presence environment where we want to be able to have citizen journalists be able to capture images with trust and then distribute that online so that we as a society, again, know what to believe and know how to form our own opinions. And we know, especially heading into the US presidential election season, that's going to be key. Fascinating stuff there. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Jeffrey McGregor, TruePic CEO. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, we've got something of a theme developing in the beer space. AB InBev, Carlsberg, and Heineken all growing their top lines in the third quarter thanks to price increases and consumers choosing pricier beverages. But AB InBev is still seeing its U.S. revenues affected by the Bud Light boycott. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma was on the earnings call to give us the details here. Uh, Brooke, on higher prices, though, the question is how much longer consumers are willing to pay a premium. Absolutely, Akiko. I mean, how much longer are they willing to pay is certainly a question that many analysts as well as consumers are even putting up and tossing in the idea with. But most importantly, premium brands is something of a trend that we are seeing in the industry. It's one of the biggest growth opportunities that AB Inv have said on the call with brands like Budweiser, Stella Artois, and Michelob Ultra saying that their portfolio is well positioned to meet this demand for premium and pricier beers. But in addition to that, they did add that the markets that they're in do remain dynamic and they continue to invest in long-term uh, growth in order to deliver profitability. But some other takeaways from the call is really, oh, that $1 billion buyback program that they announced in the release. They weighed in and added more color on the call saying that it will be effective almost immediately and will happen over the course of the next 12 months and is really in an effort to maximize value creation for its shareholders. And on that fallout from the boycott, the company said they have a good grip on what they need to do now in the U.S. markets and how they plan to proceed from here. They said they do not think they're at the new normal yet, of course, following that backlash that happened nearly seven months ago after they teamed up with uh, transgender influencer Dylan Mulvaney and then faced a boycott and then a reverse boycott. But they did say they're seeing stable market share now and improvement in the last quarter, and they even added that while Bud Light drinkers are ready to come back and open to the idea of drinking again, they continue to work towards regaining that market share. And marketing spend is one thing that they're really emphasizing. Of course, many of us have seen that easy to Sunday ad during this NFL season. And they also have that UFC deal set to start on January 1st, 2024. And they're really looking to capitalize on the growth of the UFC that they've seen in recent years, hoping to jump on that bandwagon as well. Now, Brooke, something else that we've been noticing, of course, GLP-1s or the weight loss drugs, they've been such a big topic in the food and beverage industry. Any mention of that on the call? Yeah, Rochelle, I feel like nowadays you just can't go an earnings call with at least one question. Sometimes there aren't always, but there certainly was one today from a Goldman Sachs analyst who asked about the potential risk to volume growth on the call. Anheuser-Busch CEO weighed in. At this stage, I think that's too early to assess any overlap or change in behavior in relevant consumer groups. You see that the penetration of these drugs is still very small. And that is like relatively wide range of points of view on where this is going with very limited data. I think that for us, we don't see any impact so far in the business. And he went on to say that they're not in the indulgence business. They do have a range of low calorie, low carb, and non-alcohol offerings, which we're seeing a slight pickup in as well, but no data yet to see a full direct impact. We do keep hearing that theme about it being too early, at least yet, to really see that impact. But it'll be interesting to see if that shows up in future earnings calls. Our very own Brooke De Palma. Thanks so much. Well, shifting gears to the Conference Board's Consumer Confidence Index, it dropped for the third month in a row, though not by as much as feared. So it seems Americans are not all that confident in the economy, but they keep on spending anyway. And so the economy keeps chugging along. Have I got that right? Well, so if retail therapy is helping deal with the doom and gloom, where is this money coming from? Well, let's talk debt. All year, we've been talking about the strength of the consumer propelling the economy along, but was it built on a house of cards that's ready to fall? Well, the San Francisco Fed has been among those in recent months to warn over dwindling pandemic savings. In a publication earlier this summer, it highlighted the rapid accumulation and then drawdown of excess savings following the pandemic recession, saying, it contrasts starkly with prior recessions. So is there a sense of impending doom here? One thing is for sure, Americans are sitting on a mountain of credit card debt, well over a trillion dollars at this point. And according to the latest data from the New York Fed, it's up from the first quarter of 2023's record number. So what's your best weapon against this burden growing out of control? Joining us now is Matt Schultz, <clears throat> LendingTree Chief 
credit analyst. Uh, Matt, good to talk to you today. Paint the picture for me first, though. I mean, we kind of rattled off some numbers there about where the consumer is today, but how quickly is that debt mounting? It's mounting like crazy. Like you said, we topped a trillion dollars in credit card debt for the first time earlier this year, and that number is only going to rise. And even though delinquencies are still relatively low by historical standards, they're rising and things are normalizing a little bit. Um, and even with all of that, the consumer, with most of the numbers, show that the consumer is still doing pretty well. Although I can't help but think that that the margin for error for a lot of these households is pretty small and it wouldn't take a whole lot to shift somebody from feeling pretty good about their finances to feeling pretty shaky. Because Matt, it is hard to decipher because we keep getting these narratives about, about the mountain credit card debt, how obviously more Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And then FICO coming out with a report saying that the average FICO score has gone up versus the past year. How do you, when you look at that data as a whole, is it because there's some sort of lag or is there some sort of other shoe to drop that hasn't made its way into these credit scores yet? Well, the uh, credit scores are kind of a lagging indicator, but they're also just kind of imperfect by nature. For one thing, it doesn't necessarily show where people stand with student loan repayments and how uh, how able they are to make those. And even when student loan payments crank up in full, those defaults and delinquencies won't be reported for another year. So that's going to be another gap. And then another big thing that's missing from these FICO scores and, and all credit scores is buy now, pay later loans. And we know that those are a huge phenomenon there's a lot of money in those. And even though those tend to be short-term debt, they are still impactful as to the average consumer's financial situation. So there's so many X factors. It's just a funky time in the economy generally. So it's all of these numbers give these kind of mixed, uh, mixed answers. And Matt, of course, we're seeing all this against the backdrop of, of rising rates and you know, if people have checked their credit card lately, those rates are, are really high when you compare it to where they were several years ago. Uh, we've had a number of guests that have come on who, who said, look, sometimes you can call your credit card company to see if you can negotiate a rate down. Um, what do you advise there specifically um, for those consumers who have high debt, given just how that could really ding their credit score? You, you absolutely positively can call your credit card issuer and ask for a lower interest rate. We've been tracking this for a few years at LendingTree. And when we did a survey earlier this year, we found that 76% of folks who asked for a lower interest rate on their credit card in the past year got one. And the average reduction was about six points. So that's the equivalent of going from 25% to 19% on your credit card APR. And that's a really big deal. And with that type of success rate, 76%, it shows that it's not just people with 750 credit scores and long track records that are getting their way. It's people who need help. It's just regular folks who are struggling along. So it's a really good idea to make that call. Maybe use an offer that you've seen at LendingTree or in your snail mail to help kind of frame that conversation and see if your credit card issuer will match that other offer. It's such a competitive marketplace now, there's a good chance that they'll at least listen to you. Some good takeaways there. Matt Schultz, Lending Tree Chief Credit Analyst. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Let's now head over to Yahoo Finance's Brad Smith, who's standing by with a special guest. Yeah, thanks so much, Akiko. A special guest indeed. Athleisure, we do know, is on the rise, and it has been on the rise as people are shifting more towards comfort here. And clothing company Roan is certainly looking to capitalize on that, nearly doubling its retail footprint from last year with the addition of 11 new stores, plus planning to launch its first women's collection in May of 2024. Nate Chekets, Roan co-founder and CEO, joins me now. Nate, 
Great to speak with you once again and, and to get an update on the business. This is a significant financial move that you've made for the capital uh, and regaining some of that ownership of the company. Walk us through why this was the time to do that and what type of expansion you plan to out, uh, unlock with that. Well, a big part of it is the business is doing tremendously well. And we started to see some of the indications that that would be the case really at the beginning of 2022, uh, during the time when macroeconomic situation was on, on the reverse. And so we had hired a couple of really strong executives that we had brought in. We knew that we wanted to make the move into women's. And really what changed for me and my brother personally is we wanted to run and own the business for a very long time. And that's just not the nature of private or, or venture equity capital. So uh, we brought in some really exciting new investors. We have seven professional sports team owners that are now on the cap table, and we're really highly focused on continuing to grow and build the terrific product. And building out the product, it's also building out the number of people that you're marketing to, that you're appealing to, and particularly here with a women's collection set to launch in 2024 here. Talk us through the entry point. What apparel seems most gettable, if you will. I know it's not proper English, but sometimes it's just good preaching. What is most gettable for the Roan brands to uh, have a successful entry point into women's? Well, there's certainly a lot more competition in the women's market, but what we found in both spending a lot of time with our our customer, 30% of our customers today are women, usually buying for the men in their lives. So spending time with them and then talking to uh, the market at Broad, what we know is that active is still going to be a really important part of their lifestyle, but also our commuter line, which has done so well on the men's side, will be a part of the line as well. So we plan to be able to outfit her for about 80% of her day's activities. You, you've got uh, an executive team build out as well here, Nate, that would suggest and lead many to think that maybe there's an IPO on the horizon. Wh what does that look like? What is the timing that you and the team toss around, if at all? What does that conversation entail and what do you look for in the market? Well, really, we're not focused on the short or midterm of, of going public, but what we are really focused on is building a great long term business. So internally, we talk about developing public ready protocols because we believe it's important to compare ourselves to really well-run public companies, but it's not on the short or midterm horizon to go public. We just want to build great products for our customers. Absolutely. Nate, great to have you on here with us today. We're coming up to the 12 p.m. noon marker here, so we got to leave the conversation there. We'd love to check back in in the future. Nate Chekets, who is the co-founder and CEO. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks. Well, we're watching shares of Warner Brothers Discovery after the media giant announced a new partnership with immersive technology company Cosm to allow sports fans access to select live sporting events from TNT at two new venues in 2024. The venues will be 360-degree domes with 87-foot diameter 8K LED screens. Uh, Rochelle, you know, if you if anybody that's been watching sort of the, the feeds that have coming out of Vegas sphere. Um, my understanding is this is kind of similar to that experience. We're talking about two venues, 65,000 square foot building in LA, 70,000 square foot in Dallas with seating for 800 fans. I guess this is the next best thing to, to going to a game, but this is one of those instances where I kind of feel like VR could do it for you. If you can't go to the actual game, wouldn't you just rather put on the headset and stay at home? Or am I missing the point? I mean, I mean, the thing is, and even when we think of the the sphere in Vegas, I get it. It's a it's a concert, like it's the music, it's the whole vibe. But if I'm sitting at home, I could be sitting at home watching the sporting event versus watching it. Like, there's no one's going to go jumping over my head in this 3D thing. I just, for me, I don't get the appeal of doing this for for sports, I, for a, a concert or something, a movie, something that's you know really about the music and the visuals. That I get. I'm not sure I get the use case for it in this situation. But I mean, it, it might be one of those things you have to try to see its uses. But as you mentioned there, VR, AR, you could sit home with your own goggles and your free, you know, snacks and drinks instead of, you know, being, being out there paying money yeah. and then for the same experience you could have had at home.
I guess the idea is to kind of create like a sports bar like atmosphere, which, you know, I'm willing to try out, but we'll see how this technology is distributed. Uh, interesting, though, at least in terms of sports viewing and where things are likely to go with that technology. Uh, that does it for now. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Rochelle Akufo. We've got much more to come here on Yahoo Finance Live. Keep it right here.